Trina Foley, your Orange County Supervisor, and I'm here today with our Chairman, Doug Chafee, and at this time we would like to begin our hearing with the pledge led by our Laguna Beach Mayor, Sue Kemp. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good morning. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started. Um, <clears throat> today we are hoping that we learn a lot from our panel of experts um, during this investigative hearing on homelessness in Orange County. I want to start by stating the obvious. Orange County faces a homelessness crisis. We also face an affordability crisis, an addiction crisis, and a mental health crisis. These crises are not unrelated to one another and addressing them in silos is not working. Last year we saw a record 396 deaths among the homeless population with at least 106 of these deaths involving fentanyl. The status quo is not acceptable, both for the most vulnerable members of our community and for the public at large who don't want our streets dominated by homeless encampments. The status quo is also costly as the United Way UCI cost study demonstrated, the cost burden of not addressing homelessness leads our cities, police departments, emergency rooms to pick up the financial burden, while the problem continues to fester. The urgency of addressing homelessness have, has never been greater, and it is my top priority as your supervisor. Homelessness is not going to be solved overnight. It requires coordinated, outcome-based approach. And even all the resources in the world, even with all the resources in the world, it cannot be solved by one individual, one city, one program, or one elected official. We must accept that a homelessness is a regional problem and it requires a regional solution. And that is the role of the county. I've organized this investigative hearing on homelessness to hear from experts across all levels of government, nonprofits, law and law enforcement about homelessness in Orange County. Quite frankly, I've invited five, if I could have invited five times the people to really understand the scope, we, but I don't think that Kimberly found room in my calendar for a 12 hour hearing. The goal is fact finding, which we hope that we will hear today from our panel of experts and we will be able to assess the county's current approach, identify policy successes, policy gaps, and solutions to move forward. Everything is on the table as it relates to this hearing today. We didn't want to start from scratch and so in preparation for this hearing, my team and I reviewed all the major reports on homelessness in Orange County that we could get a hold of. We also reviewed many public comment submissions from residents. The input and all the relevant reports will be posted on our website with the recording. And I wanna take this time to thank my policy advisor, Alex Runagi, um, who has done an incredible job putting this hearing together and who has read through countless reports and um, listened to hearings and made sure that we were well prepared and that our office is well prepared to address solutions moving forward. So thank you, Alex. I know that wasn't in your script. <laughs> I also want to give you a roadmap for the hearing. But before I do that, I want to tell a brief story. As mayor of Costa Mesa, we battled uh, the struggle of and the challenge of how to reduce homelessness in our communities, especially in our most socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. And I remember one time I went with one of the officers because we had a lot of complaints from residents about encampments forming in one of our local parks. It was the only park in a neighborhood that was park poor. And unfortunately, children and families could no longer use the park. When we walked to the park, I had my flip-flops on. Many of you who know me know I always wear my flip-flops. And the officer said to me, oh, Mayor, don't go on the grass. And I said, why? You're in your flip-flops and needles might poke through your shoes and stab you. And at that moment, I said, why in the world would we keep this park open if there are needles that could hurt an adult who has the ability to see and move around them? 
and allow children to play here. We closed the park, we fenced it up, and some of the neighbors were not happy about that because it was the only open space available. But guess what? If you went to that park this weekend for the Spring Fest event, you'll see a shiny new library, a brand new playground, a community center named after the first woman mayor of Costa Mesa. And you'll also see families activated, engaging in the park in a safe way. It can be done. It just takes persistence. It takes a lot of coordinated effort. And it takes courage to do things that maybe are uncomfortable. So I'm optimistic that we can reduce homelessness, help people live a more dignified life, and reduce the impacts on our greater community. I want to give the roadmap now. So panel one will focus on the county's efforts to address homelessness, including the many areas of progress that we have seen over the last year. We will hear from Chairman Doug Chafee, and, um, who chairs the Commission to End Homelessness, as well as Doug Becht, the Director of Office and Care Coordination. Panel two will feature testimony from Moss Adams and Wound Walk, who, by my, who my office hired to conduct an audit and census to better understand our county's approach to homelessness. We'll then take a brief break. Then panel three will include leaders from three cities, Laguna Beach, Santa Ana, and Costa Mesa, to help us understand the city and law enforcement's role in addressing homelessness. Panel four will focus on opportunities and solutions, especially as it relates to veterans homelessness, youth homelessness, and Project Home Key, a great initiative that I look forward to sharing with you. I know uh, Chairman Chafee will touch on that a bit. Members of the public will also have the opportunity to give public comments about 11.20 a.m., so long as we all stay on track in terms of our time. We're already getting a little bit of a late start. Um, this is being streamed live on Facebook, and a recording will be available on my website, on the county website. I want to thank everyone, especially our panelists, for taking the time to participate in this important hearing. And at this time, I'd like to go forward and introduce panel number one. First, I'm pleased to introduce Chairman Doug Chafee. Doug Chafee serves as Chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. He also chairs the Commission to End Homelessness and the OC Housing Finance Trust. Chairman Chafee has also been a leading voice in our county to address our mental health and addiction crisis. I'm grateful that the Chairman is here today to share his critical insights. I'm also pleased to introduce Doug Beck. Doug is the Director of Office of Care Coordination. He has been with the county for one and a half years. He comes from New York City where he has had significant experience on homelessness issues. Doug was kind enough to join me for our landlord briefing on emergency housing vouchers last week. Doug, I promise there will not be a third hearing next week. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Chairman Chafee, can you give us an overview and highlight some of the ongoing county efforts? Uh, thank you, Supervisor Foley, for setting up this forum, inviting me to talk about some of the efforts that the county has been doing to try to address the homelessness challenge, as well as the other challenges that you mentioned, such as the drug usage issues. I'm very pleased that in every case we try to strive for innovative and best practices, which are at the heart of everything we try to do. I'm going to touch on uh, several different areas. One is what we call Project Home Key. Another is the work of the Orange County Housing Finance Trust. And I'd like to talk about our efforts in the north, uh, what you call the North Service Planning Area, and also the Orange County Commission on Homelessness, and finally, Project Hope, which is a new project being initiated in, uh, in Fullerton, which will serve as a dispatch point for some 14 cities who want to have the services of social workers. So if I start with Project Home Key, first I've mentioned that Stanton, the city, is the champion in this regard. And Stanton Mayor David Schauber will be part of a, another panel coming up. But if I may, I just touch a little bit on some of the highlights. I know uh, Mayor Stanton will also remark about not just the providing of affordable housing, but how it has helped to revitalize the area in his city and also to reduce some of the policing needs. So it's more than just housing. So if I might, uh, in partnership with Jambri Housing, 
The county submitted an application to convert the 60 unit Tahiti Motel, the 72 unit Stanton Inn Suite for Project Home Key funding. We're successful in getting about $26 million from the state to move forward with these housing projects which are in Stanton. I would remark that this funding is competitive. You have to have a good application. It's competitive with others throughout the state. There's another one that is uh, underway. It's also in Stanton and has been awarded $6 million uh, to revitalize the Riviera Motel. Altogether, these work out to 152 possible units of affordable housing. Then the Huntington Beach, compliments to Huntington Beach, they have been awarded $17 million to provide 17 units of permanent supportive housing for individuals experiencing what we call chronic homelessness. It's in partnership with American ha Family Housing and the city of uh, Huntington Beach. Costa Mesa has a project that is pending funding, so we'll see how that comes out. But if it works, it can convert a motel into about 88 more units of affordable housing. Then, of course, the city of Anaheim will not be left out. They are uh, supporting a home key site with um, converting a Motel 6 into 87 units of permanent supporting housing. In, uh, and then they had another site that was um, to awarded another $26 million, if I have the number right. The county serves as a co-applicant with most cities. In the case of Anaheim, we serve as a consultant. So we can work either way and sometimes the combination of that. So I'm sure Mayor Schaffer will flesh out uh, the results he's had with Project Home Key in another panel. Now I'd like to mention some of the success we've had with the Orange County Housing Finance Trust. And I, while I'm chair, that only lasts until July. We do rotate the chair between the cities and the county. Uh, so my time will be up in July, and I would like to invite and hope that um, Steve Fossil, my vice chairman for the city of Anaheim, will take that over and continue to run with what we've been doing. We do have uh, a goal uh, of creating some 2,700 affordable housing units with appropriate services. It's more than just providing housing. The uh, homeless people that uh, are in them need to have the help to get over some of the other problems that they may have experienced, be it, uh, be it uh, mental health, drug usage disorders, those kind of things are often a combination of the two. So services are very important, not just the housing aspect of it. So our goal, I think, will be uh, met. Uh, we have already uh, at 900 that are under construction. Some have been completed. I think the latest RFP will take us over 1,500. They're well underway of our goal, 2,700 by I think the year was 2025, if I remember. When we get there, I think we'll double that number and try to do that again. Significantly, we've asked the state to help us with some $30 million, which will help finance the construction of more uh, permanent supportive housing units and create important jobs too as part of this process. It's composed of some 23 cities. We invite the remaining 11 to join. Give you a free ride for a while if you would. Uh, and I would significant to note that uh, the funding request is support with all of our Sacramento representatives. So I think we'll get, hopefully get all of that. If not, we'll get most of it. And uh, that will uh, if I, I may summarize, so far in the three years since our formation, we've committed $20 million for the trust to help finance gaps. We do not wholly finance a project. We look to the gaps towards 13 projects scattered throughout Orange County. I, I might mention at this point a issue that is uh, there is when we have our navigation centers, they do a good job. but. Where do you go next? That, that's the cog and the clog in the system. So we don't have places to place people next. And that's where all this housing is so important. We have another place to create a flow through to get people from the, off the street into shelter and finally into the housing that they need with services. Oops, I apologize. Of course, it's a scam. Uh, then I'd like also to uh, address a little bit about our North Spa. Uh, it is a collaborative of some 11 cities. And together, we've created two navigation centers, one in the city of Buena Park, one in the city of Placentia. And uh, they are doing a great job. The county is a partner there. Uh, these two uh, spas, uh, 
I'm sorry, these two uh, homeless navigation centers create about 250 beds for people. The county is supporting each of these uh, navigation centers mm -hmm. annually to help run them, about a million and a quarter each. That's about what it ha takes. And we did help with the initial granting application to help establish them. So kudos to the cities and our spa for joining together. And then part of that is the city managers meet regularly on a monthly basis to discuss not only the homelessness issues but the needs they have, and that creates a camaraderie among them. So I'd also mention the uh, city of Anaheim is sometimes doing its own thing, and they have a center of hope, and they're now completing a 325-unit low barrier, which is very important, uh, emergency shelter with 72 permanent supporting housing units providing on-site medical and also dental care, which is kind of rare when, when we look at all the things that are being done. Now, if I may, I would also like to briefly address um, our Orange County Commission to end homelessness. Uh, we have been trying uh, to move forward, trying to take a new look at things so we can study homelessness better. We've been dividing the effort into what we call four pillars, prevention, outreach and supportive services when you're on the street, shelter, and finally housing. Those are the areas we identified that need in-depth study, and we are in the process of uh, looking at each one with best practices to observe as we approach each of those components. I expect we'll finish that by about July. Then the next effort will be to look at the county's 10-year plan, what did it do well, what is missing, what new efforts are there, and that will be involving also the public in public forums. So when that 10-year plan was already established, it was pursuant to public input. So we want to do that again, uh, not only to get that input, but also the public can understand the uh, dilemmas and the efforts we're taking and how we go about working together to solve those things. So if I may, I'd also then like to address get my notes here. One, one more area which is new and innovative, uh, which is called Project HOPE, uh, which is uh, new in Fullerton. It's a, if I may characterize it, as a central dispatch area for social workers. The focus is to go out to uh, homeless people on the street to help them. It was established by the North County uh, Justice Collaborative, but it is featuring social workers. And they have a special building that is being built or rehabilitated, I should say, as I speak, and should be online and working in about two months. There's some 14 cities that have gone together to make that happen. And they will, social workers will be dispatched as needed 24 seven to any of the crises that may happen among homeless people in those, 20, in those 14 cities. This is a new model. Uh, some cities cannot afford to have social workers, but this combines the efforts uh, of different kinds of specialties. The social workers are especially trained to address not only uh, mental issues, but substance use disorders to help with the needs that they have on the street. Among the entities that are helping there are the Orange County Healthcare Agency, the Orange County Social Service Agency, Cal Optima with its new street medicine initiative, and even St. Jude Medical Center is helping out. Uh, so, uh, but it's important that you don't stop at just on the street. The social workers are trained to put people to services, largely what the county provides. They can't just stop there. Now, you can treat the need, but then it continues unless you provide the services that are needed. If there is an opportunity for housing, they will try to place them in housing. So it's a continuous effort that has been somewhat missing, and I hope that one day morphs into more than that, because people that are not homeless have social service needs too. And ideally, we would find uh, the social workers working uh, on uh, 911 calls, dispatch is a key, is it a police call, or is it something that can be handled by social service workers? I think uh, the police that are I've talked to are very excited to relieve them of some of the issues that they are not trained for, and they get uh, the homeless people, or people on the street, the kind of service that they need in, in an innovative and, dis and a holistic way. And so, again, I think that will be a uh, 
cost-effective way of getting the services to the different cities that may not otherwise have the ability to do that. And if it works, this is a trial, we hopefully may spread this throughout the county and uh, provide social services in an effective way, using good practices, best practices, I would say, uh, to help out throughout the whole county. Again, I would reiterate the problem has been getting housing. Uh, we do have navigation centers, but we can't have people just live there forever. They need to have a path out. And that's where I, I think the biggest clog is, and that takes time. Housing does not happen overnight. Uh, but we are doing uh, a lot, with, for example, Project Home Key and our Orange County Housing Finance Trust are, is another tool to achieve that end. We're not neglecting, though, the other affordability issues. The county has a number of vouchers that can help out. Uh, the issue there, again, is finding a, a space that can use the voucher. Uh, my own opinion of the voucher program, they are best used when they are project-based because that helps with the financing and that guarantees a spot for a homeless person or someone else that needs affordable help. I, I think a, a key here to Inley Homelessness is prevention. We kind of keep people from falling into that trap in the first place. So thank you, uh, Supervisor Foley, and it's, it's my pleasure to have addressed uh, this forum today. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I look forward to learning more about Project Hope. Um, I've long been an advocate for getting people out social workers out into the street and having the county serve that role. So I'm looking forward to getting a little bit more detail about that. Now we're gonna to move to uh, Mr. Becht, who is our Office of Care and Coordination. And Mr. Becht, uh, if you could uh, give us some added details about ongoing efforts to address uh, homelessness, as especially encampments. Yeah, th thank you, Supervisor. Um, so we're excited to talk about the um, encampment resolution funding that the county received earlier this year. So late last summer, the governor announced the dedication, a little over $47 million to the encampment resolution um, funding program. This program focuses on uh, local demonstration projects for innovative ways to address encampments um, in communities. Um, Early in the winter, uh, Orange County submitted an application uh, to this uh, funding stream to address specifically Talbert Park in the city of Costa Mesa. Over the last year, um, our outreach teams, the outreach teams with the city of Costa Mesa uh, uh, engaged with over 100 individuals in that park. And we f are excited that um, earlier in February, the state provided us with a um, uh, a notice of intent to award us $3.6 million specifically to address uh, the encampments in Talbert Park. What that $3.6 million is going to help provide us do is it's going to help um, A, dedicate several staff members uh, to uh, that particular park. And those staff members will be case managers and social workers. So two case managers and, three, and one social worker will be solely dedicated to uh, engage and serve the individuals that are in that park, hopefully working with them towards uh, gaining uh, temporary and permanent housing. Funding will also allow us to work uh, more closely with our parks department uh, and provide them with funding both for additional staffing to uh, canvas the park and assist in our uh, collaboration with cleaning up the encampments, but also significant funding that will uh, help them restore the park to its intended and original purpose. This is also a, a collaboration between uh, the county and the city of Costa Mesa. The city of Costa Mesa has dedicated significant funding and resourcing, resources to address homelessness in their community, both on the outreach uh, front, uh, shelter, and permanent housing. And, when we went into this application and we went into this project, um, we knew that working with the city of Costa Mesa would be uh, critical in our ability to be successful in this project. So we're excited that uh, the partnership that we continue to solidify and strengthen between the county and the city of Costa Mesa will really p uh, pay dividends here in this project. Um, additionally, um, 
we see that this project overall provides us the unique ability to uh, see the uh, unique opportunity to uh, see how when focusing specific resources and efforts onto one geographic location uh, and one group of folks, both uh, you know, a- attempting to clean up the encampment, but most importantly, helping those individuals get into permanent, and, uh, permanent housing uh, will have not only on the impact of the people that are living there, but the park itself and um, you know, the neighbors that uh, intend on using the park for its intended purposes. Um, yeah. So, hey. Okay, thank you. So I had a couple questions. Absolutely. First of all, you know I get a lot of emails and calls about encampments, mm-hmm. not just in Costa Mesa, although I'm very familiar with Talbert Park and the years of struggle that we have had um, when I was a city council member and mayor of the city. Uh, and always one of the, the gaps in services was that we didn't have funding for dedicated people to be out in the park, whether it's Talbert Park, whether it's uh, uh, Angel Park over here in Santa Ana. Um, having a dedicated staff member, whether it's the flood channels, you and I were out in the flood channel recently about uh, some concerns about people living in the flood channel. Um, I hope that this Talbert Park uh, partner-based project uh, becomes a model for how we need to drive resources, not just money, but people, to an area in order to make sure there's consistency. Because many times Talbert Park has been cleared over the last five years. Judge Carter and I went out to Talbert Park when we first opened the shelter, and there were solar panels, there was a latrine out there, they had created a whole community. And, and so unless we have dedicated staff resources to prevent the encampment from forming again, we're just going to continue to invest and reinvest and invest and reinvest and have no positive outcome. So what are we going to do to make sure that we have consistent uh, outreach in what I'm going to term hotspot areas. Yeah, so th- that's a terrific point and a terrific question. So specifically in Talbert Park, what's unique, I think the most important takeaway from this funding is the ability to have dedicated staff to a very specific area. The consistency in engaging folks and helping them navigate through a system is incredibly important. We, uh, we have, as we've heard, a tremendous amount of resources throughout our homeless service system. Often our experience is that individuals who are living on the street or are living in a park, uh, you know, have challenges navigating our, you know, the system, understanding when to plug into it, where to plug into it. And that's where having dedicated staff that not only help them navigate that, but most importantly, um, create a rapport with those individuals so that there's a rapport there of trust and, uh, that'll help them navigate the system uh, know which resources to um, plug into at the appropriate time. What we're also excited about is is that um, the county and our office specifically is in the process of uh, awarding contracts countywide to uh, nonprofit organizations to provide a regional approach to addressing homelessness uh, on the street, providing that specific consistent outreach and engagement and care coordination that uh, I've just mentioned and that you've asked about to ensure that folks are able to not only access the services, but they know how to, and they have someone that could consistently be out there and help them navigate, physically navigate those services. Um, So So the chairman talked about a program, Project Hope. Is that a county program? Project Hope is an initiative or a uh, collection of efforts that are being uh, spearheaded by the North Orange County Public Safety Task Force, which I... Is that Senator Newman's task force? I believe so. Okay. Uh, I, I can't speak specifically to that, but I, I believe that is their group. And uh, we intend to... Uh, we have, or the Continuum of Care is funding a specific one-year outreach project uh, in the North Spa that will be uh, ideally stationed out of that Project HOPE facility. 
Okay. The, what, what I'm hearing is we have some great programs occurring in the north. Yeah. We've got this great program to address encampments in uh, Costa Mesa. I'm sure we'll hear from others about other um, um, good programs. What I've struggled with since I've joined the board is that it does not seem that we have a cohesive strategy that is a regional strategy across the board. So that instead of hiring a nonprofit to address something in Huntington Beach and Costa Mesa, we have consistent staffing that it's their job to go out every single day. What can we do to have a more cohesive program? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a couple of efforts that I believe will get us closer to achieving that. First is uh, our outreach and engagement uh, s team in, the, in HCA, in the healthcare agency. The second is the uh, particular programming that uh, the Office of Care Coordination and the Continuum of Care are looking to fund starting July 1st, which is uh, regional outreach and uh, care coordination, which will provide uh, specific teams to do comprehensive outreach uh, throughout the county, three teams, one per spa. That's our regional approach is what we've taken historically uh, and we've found that to be successful. And then the third piece is the county's Care Plus program, which is a countywide um, program led by the Office of Care Coordination that brings together a multi-departmental team, a multidisciplinary team uh, consisting of uh, members of the Mental Health uh, Recovery Services Department, uh, other departments in the healthcare agency, the Social Service Agency, Department of uh, Probation, that help make sure that individuals who are touching multiple systems uh, throughout the county are getting one coordinated uh, effort around care, and that the different systems throughout the county and in the very near future, the different systems uh, that are working outside of the county, some of our uh, city partners and our nonprofit partners are t speaking and uh, talking to each other. We, that particular program uh, is helped out by a data integration uh, system called uh, SOCTIS uh, that allows for data coming from uh, several different source databases, and not to get too techy, but it essentially uh, several different county d databases. Uh, to come into one specific database so that if an individual is touching several systems, I could go into that database and I could see, okay, I engaged him through our efforts uh, around addressing homelessness, but I see that he's got an active or an inactive case with SSA and that he's working with his probation officer. How do I make sure that I coordinate with them uh, to ensure that we're all on the same page and that we're not requiring that individual to do some uh, extra a leg work uh, to ensure that we're coordinating on our end. So we're excited about that. Okay, that sounds great. Now, I have two last questions before we move on. Thank Absolutely. you so much for being here. Um, you mentioned the $3.6 million for the Talbert Park um, encampment removal effort and two case managers, dedicated staff from the county, mm -hmm. one social worker working with our parks. Um, will any of that funding be uh, provided to the city of Costa Mesa to offset their uh, staffing that they are employing into that area? So we worked uh, closely with the city of Costa Mesa when we put together this grant and spoke to them about that option. Uh, ultimately, there, there will not be any specific funding going to the city of Costa Mesa. What we did uh, discuss is that these two outreach workers and, and social worker uh, will, as I've mentioned, will be dedicated to the, to the park, allowing uh, the city's resources to uh, not spend as much time in the park, to say the very least. Uh, and we will be partnering with them. The city of Costa Mesa also has uh, you know, uh, agreed to ensure that anyone in the park uh, that is residing in the city of Costa Mesa will have access uh, to their shelter uh, based on availability. So the partnership's there. Okay. Well, as you know, I've said this many times, um, it's great to have a partnership, but the partnership should include funding yeah. because the cities are basically, I think, taking on the role of the county in terms of the funding uh, in 
particular cities that are not part of the top 15 who don't get direct funding from the state. The only funding that cities get is from the county or if they apply for some kind of a grant. But there is no direct funding that flows to the cities uh, from the state to address homelessness, mental health services, social work type uh, services. Is, that's right, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for this particular project, the city uh, stated that they did not need funding and they felt like our, our staffing uh, pattern and our funding structure uh, w was the ideal one for this particular effort. Well, I find that hard to believe, but okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Um, uh, okay, my final question is, when will we know the results of the point in time count? Uh, uh, we, sh we believe that we'll know the results and be able to uh, announce them uh, sometime in early May, okay. in the next couple of weeks. All right, that sounds good. Well, before we move on to the next panel, I want to go back to what the chairman said about the need to address housing. And I completely agree that we must look at um, maximizing project-based vouchers and also ensuring that our Orange County Housing Finance Trust has all the resources it needs to make sure that the 2,700 units are built and, and then some. Um, I hope that we can work on these items together. And I know that there's a lot of good people uh, that have a lot of good suggestions for how we can um, create more housing that's affordable and reduce that clog that you talked yeah. about. Yeah. Okay, thank Mr. you so much, Mr. Beck. And, uh, Mayor Chairman, Mayor did you want to make any one, last one, words? One, one more thing. Uh, part of the funding that the Housing Finance Trust has is uh, Mental Health Services Act money that the uh, board has authorized. And so part of the things that we look at is can we have special units in a project that have uh, addressed the special needs of, of uh, mental health and or uh, drug usage disorders or some combination. That's what that money is particularly funded for. And so we do look at projects to try to include not all of it that way, but at least a component of it. Okay, wonderful. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that. And I, I do appreciate the um, update on Project HOPE. That sounds like something we need to also learn more about, so thank you. Uh, we're going to take a brief break at this time as we switch out the panels. And so if we, um, Chairman and Mr. Beck, if you'd like to come down here as well, um, we'll take a quick picture. We'll take a five-minute break.
Colleen, can you unmute and we'll do a quick test. Okay, we're back on the air now. Everyone can take their seats, we? please. We are. Sir, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great. Okay, we're running about six minutes behind, so I'm gonna to try to catch up. <laughs> um, so we have uh, our next panel addressing the cost and consequences of homelessness in Orange County. And so let's get started with our next panel. When I took office last year, I used my discretionary office funds to hire Moss Adams, who was recommended by our state controller, Betty Yee, and also happened to be a county contract vendor as well. And when we hired them, we hired them to conduct an inventory of county contracts with and county funding to providers of homelessness, housing, mental health, and drug and alcohol treatment services in Orange County's then second district. And so the, the, what was determined, and you'll hear from Colleen Rosillas from uh, Moss Adams, was that many of our contracts could not be isolated to a particular district because they're more regional. So that's actually good news. So today, Moss Adams partner, Colleen Rosillas, will share the results of the inventory, as well as takeaways and recommendations for going forward. Colleen is a partner at Moss Adams with more than 15 years of experience in strategy, operations, and organizational consulting services to local, state, and tribal governments, K-12 and higher education and private companies utilities and energy and not-for-profits. Colleen will be joining us virtually and we're grateful that she will share her insights. Next, after Colleen, we'll have Catherine White from Woundwalk. In addition to the audit, I also hired Woundwalk Orange County to survey the most chronically homeless in our community to better understand their most pressing needs, along with the gaps and inadequacies of how services are delivered. Wound Walk offers support and wound care and kindness to people living on the street. I want to thank them for their insights and for the important work they do. I'm especially grateful for founder Michael Sean Wright for all the hours that he serves in our community to help people. Today we'll hear from Catherine White who will present the survey results from uh, the Wound Walk. Uh, so let's get started with Colleen. Uh, Colleen, can you hear us? I can. Okay, so please share the findings, takeaways, and any other important information that the inventory your firm conducted, and then I'll ask you some brief questions. All right, great, and thank you for that very complimentary uh, introduction. Um, we're very happy to be here today to share our results. Um, Alex, if you wouldn't mind going to um, our third slide um, showing our project scope, because I think the supervisor gave a great introduction to our work today. Um, we were engaged uh, by the supervisor's office in July last year um, to conduct an inventory of county contracts with and county funding to um, providers of services um, to the homeless. And that uh, encompassed um, homelessness um, response and prevention services, housing services, mental health and drug and alcohol treatment services. Our initial scope was, as the supervisor mentioned, to the county second district. We quickly realized that um, district boundaries were not necessarily applicable for services provided to the homeless, but it didn't really matter where you lived, that if you were um, experiencing homelessness, um, mental health uh, challenges or needed services or drug and alcohol treatment services, that it didn't matter where in the county that you were, the services were number one, available to you, and that um, folks were would travel to access those services. And so we expanded the scope of our work to um, ensure that we collected uh, information on services provided across the county. And so this, the, these results are a point in time um, of services provided and the cost of those services as of October, 2021. Next slide, please. So our work was conducted um, by assembling information um, provided by um, Orange County Community Resources Orange County Healthcare Agency, and then the Social Services Agency. We primarily um, did this through two main methods of fact finding. The first was conducting interviews. We interviewed all agency heads and key stakeholders and county leadership. 
We also did a tremendous amount of document review. We collected all current contracts with service providers at that time, um, thousands of contracts. Um, we also reviewed annual reports from service providers. We looked at county agency and partner websites and uh, requested quite a bit of information from each agency and all the service providers uh, to gather as much information as we could about the services provided, information about the work that was being done in the county so that we could gather holistic information for the county. The next slide, please. So when we think about um, gathering this inventory, um, services are very different. Um, it's quite a complex environment. Um, we did create a service map that we delivered to the county. Um, so a couple of things to think about here is how we categorize the services. And an example here is that affordable and transitional housing, we could consider that a service to address either housing or homelessness. Um, what we did there was we looked at the target audience for that service um, to decide whether it would go in housing or homelessness. And we did work with the supervisor's office and with the agencies that um, either provided the contract or provided the direct service when we had questions about those services. Um, when we looked um, at services that were not within District 2, um, we absolutely included those, um, talking about how our scope did um, increase. And then there were some combined services. So for example, uh, a hospital that can include both addiction and mental health and may not be explicitly outlined in that contract. We did the best as we could to parse that, but there are some limitations within the data. Um, same thing for contributing services, so something like Meals on Wheels, which does have a mental health impact for, for someone. Um, if we can quantify it, we did quantify it here. So onto our results on the next slide. Um, we estimate that there is a total of $1.6 to $1.8 billion spent annually by the county based on that point in time. Um, if we were to run the inventory today, it might likely be more. Um, based on the contracts that we collected, we collected 1.65 billion. We also identified um, 110 million that was a one-time spend at that time, and there may be some additional contracts out there that we were not able to collect. Um, based on that 1.6 billion, um, 600 million is spent on homelessness, 360 million on mental health, around 300 million on healthcare, 270 million on housing, um, nine, 96 million on human services, and then 43 million on addiction. We go to the next slide of our inventory <clears throat> results. You can see the category breakdown here um, in each category. Um, and we broke that down in this graph by both agency spending, so direct spending by the county, as well as spending that was done um, through contracts by county service providers and vendors. You can see the breakdown here for each category. I won't spend too much time on here, just noting that it is a very complex system. There's a lot of money going out the door um, and there's a lot of money um, being spent you know, across the county in a lot of different ways to try to solve this very complex issue. If we go to the next slide to show um, what we wanted to point out, there are several vendors that receive funding from multiple agencies. This is quite common in this area. There are a number of vendors that um, provide services that are um, multifaceted. There are also quite a number of um, service providers that are well established in the community, very trusted partners with the county um, and have been working with the county for some time. And so we can see that there's um, there is quite a lot of uh, funds that have been for, for quite a lot of time been going out um, in partnership with the county um, to provide these direct services. So, on the next slide, we wanted to point out a number of commendations, things that the county is doing well. You know, number one, the county is very active in this space, taking advantage of available funding, being proactive, trying to address um, the homelessness problems, trying to address underlying issues such as addiction and mental health and provide services to address the homelessness crisis. Um, we see that as grant opportunities have been provided, as partnerships have popped up, the county has been very proactive and responsive to take advantage of those. Not all of our clients have been as proactive as the county has. The other is that there are some measures in place to track activities. So we have noted that there are metrics that are being tracked by some agencies. So things like year round tracking of 
um, beds and occupancies, uh, occupancy rates in shelters so that can establish where we are in terms of that utilization to understand um, where we are in terms of transitional housing and shelter utilization. Um, that's, that's a really good standard practice to have in place. Um, tracking the percent of housing vouchers that are dedicated to addressing homelessness, that's really helpful for you all. And then doing your comprehensive point in time counts and also including that subpopulation tracking in your point in time counts, not every jurisdiction does that, that's very valuable for you. We also wanted to note really proactively seeking out partners, supporting community organizations that provide direct relief services. Um, the county cannot um, and should not provide services um, directly to um, to everyone and there's just so much that has to be provided and as a resource constrained government entity there's only so much that you can do and so working in partnership with experts is a great opportunity to be able to leverage your community organizations um, and so we really want to commend you for that those partner organizations are very actively engaged um, they're very proactive in the community and are, are absolutely working hard on this um, and then we definitely noticed that county staff and, um, and county leadership is continually looking at those opportunities to provide integrated services and to provide care for folks who are experiencing homelessness. And finally, on our last slide, we have our observations and recommendations. Kind of our overarching recommendation is that the county doesn't have any unified strategy for uh, addressing homelessness, no agreed upon um, outcomes that you're working toward um, in terms of addressing homelessness. This makes you similar to most other counties on the West Coast, um, but it would be very useful to uh, move toward that approach to adopt performance measures to track the impact of homelessness over time. Um, in the absence of having those unified outcomes and performance measures, it's really difficult to effectively assess the impact of your spending to effectively see um, how are we moving toward our target? Are the steps that we're taking actually making incremental progress and assessing the impact of our services and our investments? We also wanted to note that there are concerns among county staff and some stakeholders regarding the tracking and monitoring and the accountability of these public funds. Um, before we conducted this inventory, there was no comprehensive inventory of spending for these um, funds across the county. Um, and that is common. However, um, it is it's certainly um, a best practice to understand where your funding is going and making sure that you um, have eyes on it. So understanding that is, is important. Um, so our recommendations are to develop a strategic plan for homelessness response. Those strategic plans are typically, um, I would say, about five-year strategic plans. They can be longer term, but this is a very uh, fast-moving space, and so we wouldn't want to go, you know, maybe a, a 10 to 20-year strategic plan would be too long. Um, we would want the plan to have um, formal goals and performance measures with very clearly defined targets the county leadership and your partners are actively engaged in and agree on so that you can track those. Um, we would want you to be very engaged with your partners, so cities, um, other agencies, state agencies, and other uh, funding opportunities so that you can take advantage of those and be strategic about that as you're moving forward. And in the plan, outline those reporting expectations to track your progress so that we know that we are coming back and measuring those targets and being able to adjust our strategy as we move forward. We also recommend that the county um, adopt a policy of um, our program of conducting regular performance audits to measure the effective, effectiveness of programs related to homelessness. Um, the county has a robust performance audit program already. Um, so when we think about um, the purpose of performance audits, looking at internal controls, looking at risk, looking at um, economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of public funds. This is a great opportunity to have um, independent third-party eyes on these funds. Um, and finally, within your agreements with um, service providers and vendors, establishing outcomes in those agreements consistent with the Homelessness Strategic Plan, um, establish vendor reporting requirements so that you can track those outcomes, and then establish a comprehensive grantee monitoring program so that you can make sure that your vendors are up to, up to par in terms of the services they're providing to, again, establish that accountability and trust among all of the players in this ecosystem so that you can all be moving toward those same outcomes. So with that, um, I'll end my presentation and I'll open it up for questions. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, taking the time to give that high level report. Um, when I first joined the board, I was surprised at how many contracts we approve at every board meeting because I think the perception in the community was that the county wasn't spending any money on these services, which obviously that's, that's not correct. So these contracts that we get at the board meetings, they often have some type of metrics. Um, are the metrics included in the contracts that you reviewed sufficient? Um, the metrics may be sufficient per contract. What we found was that the metrics are just not consistent across the co across contracts, um, and they're not necessarily they don't roll up to a high level. Here's where we're going as a county. So um, it is uh, most contracts do have metrics and outcomes identified, but they're not. Uh, consistent across the county and they're not aligned with any higher level where are we going what are our goals and so um, so we're not able to at a at a county level really say we're going to take any of that data and aggregate it and make it useful for decision making okay and then as I read your report and our in in our discussions it seems like we are funding services not outcomes is that accurate yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, and that's the strategy of, of most local governments is the a service focused approach. Yes. Okay. And so your recommendation is that we move into uh, a more outcome based approach. Is that right? Yes. And then did your analysis at this time, I know we, we are looking at two phases of this project and this is the first phase. Um, so I, my question might be premature, but um, did your analysis identify any waste that you found in the funding? No, it did not. That was not within our scope of work. Okay. And so we heard about the next steps. And is there anything more specific that you would recommend that the county does as it relates to uh, changing the way that we write the language of the contracts until we can come up with a strategy we heard chairman chafee talking about a 10-year plan it sounds like you would recommend a five-year plan i think that makes sense because everything just moves so quickly in this space um, but is there anything that you would recommend about the language that we include in our contracts that we could do right away um, that's a good question. If you are able to, as a group, think about, um, you know, quickly think about a, a couple of high level outcomes that you're hoping to achieve for each of these service categories and think about getting that in, or even think about um, adopting a quarterly reporting approach, um, that could be very helpful. Um, but until you have a, a plan in place, it would be challenging to, um, to have um, some contracts that have uh, some requirements in them, and then you're gonna um, you're gonna end up changing once you have the plan anyway. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And it looks like we are catching up on our time. We're now only four minutes behind. <laughs> so we're going to move to our next speaker, and uh, the presentation of our. Uh, Wound Walk Survey. Catherine White is the Operations Director for Wound Walk. She coordinates volunteers, compliance issues, and is hands-on with complex casework. She has been with the Wound Walk for two years, and she's also a licensed real estate broker. So she comes with the uh, with that perspective in mind. Uh, so, Catherine, if you could um, share some of the main findings that your organization found. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Supervisor Foley, for your introduction. I am Catherine White, um, and I do want to thank you also for your consistent concern for all of your constituents, including those who are so vulnerable. Um, we, we are an organization that is focused on wound care, first aid, and service navigation for our unhoused neighbors. Uh, we were contracted in the summer of 2021 by Supervisor Foley to complete a comprehensive survey of the needs and experience of unsheltered individuals in District 2 with special focus on the criteria of the designation of chronically unhoused. Wound Walk has worked extensively in this population, providing street medicine and outreach since, or street 
uh, wound care and first aid since t and outreach since 2016. And we've established a trusted reputation amongst that population that facilitates open communication. We engaged a team of six individuals to enter in our encampments and gatherings of unhoused individuals and conduct interviews. And we're very grateful to those individuals who did take the time and trusted us, those people living on the streets of District 2 who participated in this study. It is a fearsome thing to be as vulnerable as we, requ we requested. Um, some highlights from our data. Most individuals were homeless in the city in which they most recently had a residential address or an adjoining city. And nearly 95% were Californians who did not identify any out-of-state history. 64%, I can't quite get that to line up properly. There we go. 64% uh, of our respondents were men, 36% were women. 66% said that their health was at a range of three or worse, three out of five or worse. I'm gonna, well, well uh, 76% of respondents were able to obtain medical insurance, which is a pretty good number. 58% of those respondents did not know how to contact their primary care physician. And a full 55% of respondents had used emergency room for medical intervention in the past year. Of those who had used the emergency room for, for care, 8% of those individuals disclosed that it was for routine medical care. And 7% used it for medical detox. 49% of our respondents said that it had been more than a year since they were offered any shelter or housing resources from anyone from county or city resources. I, I do want to be clear again that the population that we're talking about are the people who've been unhoused for more than two years. These are people that aren't going to just be hanging out hoping that someone will come along. These are the people that have moved into the shadows. When asked why respondents had refused or left shelter services, the primary reasons given were because of pains from addictions and lack of feeling personal or property safety in the shelters. Other reasons disclosed involved boredom, a failure in terms of providing promised housing vouchers and navigation. An additional barrier to shelter use expressed was the good neighbor policies established between shelters and city officials, barring residents from entering and exiting the shelters on foot. Residents are required, um, people may not know this, they're required to enter the shelter by private car or Lyft or Uber or to take one of the shelter provided shuttles, but those shuttles run on limited hours. So if someone doesn't have a car, they're forced to spend their own money to leave. And that doesn't matter if they're off to work or where they're going. So um, respondents claim that these restrictions have limited their ability to work and participate in even normal life activities. The mental health and addictions of other residents in the shelter are also revealed to be a deterrent to using shelter services for those who wish to pursue work or a path toward housing. Boredom, lack of programming, and lack of appropriate mental health services, activities, and addiction support groups were also named as issues. The causes of homelessness are varied and are often multifaceted. The top reason given as a contributing factor was loss of relationship. Additional top responses including addictions, loss of job, and a mental health crisis. 67% of our respondents disclosed a mental health diagnosis. And 87% of respondents disclosed the use of drugs such as methamphetamines, fentanyl, and other sub substances. Respondents were given the opportunity to provide feedback on services from the cities and counties they believed would be most impactful. The primary answer reiterated regularly was more housing, affordable housing, and housing navigation. I'm sorry, I'm gonna pause you. Yeah. Because you're going through so many slides, we don't know what slide you're on. Yeah. Uh, we are, so there was the housing, there we go. No, you're, you're, it's, you, you have yeah. to go back. 
Go to the wheel me, that um, had the. Let me just actually go through the slides directly. Um, so go back to the wheel that had the um, one more back, I think. So this is this is one of the interesting things that we came across when they were asked if they had been offered mental health services as part of a shelter or housing navigation, despite so many of our our respondents having a mental health diagnosis, they were consistently a high percentage were not offered any mental health services as part of the shelter or housing program. I'm going to switch over to. Give me just one moment, please. Yes, 44% said that they were not offered any mental health services as part of a shelter or housing program. While 57% said that they did have a mental health diagnosis. Um, 43% 43 of our, of our respondents said they did not have access to a mental health provider when they needed one, and if they did, that it would take, um, that it would take a month or more to get a change in, change in medication. I'm sorry. There we go. 26% uh, said that it would take more than a month for them to get a therapist appointment. And it would take more than a month to get 32 percent it would take more than a month if they needed to even change a prescription or get a refill on mental health medication which obviously for anyone that has struggled with any sort of mental health realizing a month is far far too long to wait um as i said before 35 percent of our our respondents admitted a use of amphetamines 17 percent uh said fentanyl alone and there there is a there's just a large percentage of our population that is struggling with substance abuse disorders drug use has resulted in 61% of our population in being arrested while unhoused surprisingly to maybe no one this has not actually cured anyone um, and 80% of our population said that although we have such a high percentage of individuals using, um, using substances on the street, 80% of individuals said that they were never offered any medical detox when entering a shelter or housing program. 81% they were never offered rehab services when entering a shelter or housing program. 83% said they'd never been offered medi medical assisted detox outside of a shelter program. The interesting thing was that 50% of individuals said that they would be willing to enter a detox program. 30% of them saying, yes, if there was one available, I would go today. I'm going to switch back to what I was saying. Respondents were given the opportunity to provide feedback on services from the cities and counties that they believed would be most impactful. The primary answer reiterated most regularly was housing, affordable housing, and housing navigation. But secondly, an insistent request for more medically assisted detox programs and rehabs, particularly for those 
who would accept Orange County Medi-Cal. This was something that we come across regularly, that there are lots of detox programs around. But if they accepted Medi-Cal, oftentimes they would not accept Orange County Medi-Cal, um, despite being here in Orange County. The third most common response was a repeated call for more bathrooms, showers, for appropriate hygiene, and places for individuals to check in their belongings for safekeeping. Orange County has invested significant funds into, provide, into addressing the pain of homelessness. But our most vulnerable individuals remain unable to access these programs due to barriers of health and a bureaucracy that must be addressed. We are really grateful to be part of this conversation as we look for ways to bridge the gaps in the continuum of care. All right, thank you very much. I, I think what was most um, significant to me was the, um, what I think many of us already believe because we know that we're, we're doing a relatively good job of helping those who are uh, what I'll just determine describe as sort of low-hanging fruit, someone who is almost homeless but not quite there yet, and we can help them. But for our chronically homeless, the people that most people see and think about as homeless uh, that are living in parks, underpasses, um, on the streets, that there is a significant addiction um, component that we have to start addressing. And that's, that was my takeaway from the data. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we can share this with our um, director of care and coordination. And I know that the point in time count has some survey questions that likely will yield um, additional information about those issues. And so we can start maybe more fine tuned targeting that particular issue. Uh, thank you for your report. And um, Anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say in, in conjunction with what they'd said earlier in the day, the for, again, going back to this population, the ability for them to access the services, uh, 211 will provide you a list of places that you can call after you've called 211. Um, but their ability to navigate, go down four or five places and see if they can find a bed, it's, it's too much of a hindrance. So it is really a hands-on, it's really a relationship thing. If we are going to have any kind of success in helping these people re-navigate into, into general society, it's going to be because we, we take them individually, build relationships, help them navigate that system because it is, it's, it's burdensome, it's very difficult. And we've heard that many times, that the, the system is there but it's just not accessible. We also have a gap from when people are released from hospitals or released from rehab, uh, sorry, released from detox in that gap between uh, being released from detox and the availability of rehab beds. That time is sometimes a week or two or three, and that's if they're able to identify one. And that, for someone who has just recently given up a 40-year addiction, it, 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 that is an intolerable amount of time. It's, we right. are going to lose them right back to where they were. to have a better warm handoff into some transitional housing. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to take a brief break. Um, we're, we're still four minutes behind, but we're um, at least we're tracking only four minutes. Uh, and we'll take a brief break. And if I could invite the mayors to come down to the podium, and we'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, we are back with our, our next panel, and this is panel number three, and it's the city perspective. So um, as a former council member and mayor, I intimately understand the needs of our, our local cities and our local law enforcement as it relates to a homelessness crisis. The 2017 United Way UCI cost study estimated that cities bear a $120 million cost to deal with homelessness. And I would guess that that number has increased significantly. Mm -hmm. Because so much of our first responders' time is spent on addressing homelessness, the rest of the community's public safety is at a greater risk. And so today we're going to hear from three mayors and our uh, Santa Ana Police Department representative about uh, some of these issues. The first up is Mayor John Stevens, and Mayor Stevens will discuss Costa Mesa's efforts, especially the unique model of the bridge shelter in partnership with the city of Newport Beach. Mayor Stevens is an attorney with a lengthy, lengthy record of service to our community. He's devoted a significant amount of time to studying solutions to address homelessness as the former chair of the ACCOC Homelessness Task Force. Thank you, Mayor Stevens, for being here today. And then we'll hear from Mayor Sue Kempf from Laguna Beach. Sue is serving her fourth year on the city council. Prior to that, she had a successful uh, career in business. Laguna Beach is the only shelter in the South Service Planning Area, sometimes referred to as the South Spa. And this shelter was the first Orange County, the, the first city to build a shelter in Orange County. Thank you, Mayor Kempf, for being here today. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, Santa Ana Mayor Vince Sarmiento. Um, mayor Sarmiento serves as Mayor of Santa Ana. He's also an attorney. We've got a lot of lawyers in the room. <laughs> um, and Mayor Sarmiento has served on the council since 2007. Vince is joined with our um, Santa Ana Police Department representative, Ken Gominski, who will share the innovative efforts undertaken by the Santa Ana Police Department to address homelessness. Santa Ana is significantly impacted, and so I look forward to hearing from Mayor Sarmiento and Mr. Gominski's insights and what we can do better. So let's start with Mayor Stevens, if you could share your perspective from the city of Costa Mesa. Thank you, Supervisor, and uh, yes, it's a, I thank you for the invitation to be here. It's been a pleasure to work with you at the county and, and to work with you in the trenches in Costa Mesa for so many years, and I was elected in 2016. And I, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the progress we've made since 2016, um, the things we've done, and some of the outcomes we've achieved, and some of the costs that we incur uh, uh, incurred to uh, get to the point we're at now, both to create our shelter and to operate our shelter and our homeless services on an annual basis. So in 2016, when uh, I got elected, and in 2017, when we started to work on this, we had no shelter. We had a very dedicated group of um, uh, of uh, employees at the city. We had a couple of um, social workers. We had a great, uh, who we still have, code enforcement officer, and we had the um, uh, the community policing unit in the um, in the police department. And we, had spent, we were spending about a uh, million dollars a year on our homelessness outreach efforts. We were doing a lot of outreach and work together with uh, Trellis and other faith-based faith organizations. And we were really quite, I was quite impressed by the work that we were doing at the time. Um, but little did I know how many, much, many more resources we really needed to get a handle on the issue of homelessness in the city of Costa Mesa. Back then, we had a problem with encampments. Our point-in-time count in 2019 was 189 unsheltered homeless uh, individuals in the city of Costa Mesa. Uh, it was a serious situation, and as I said, we had no shelter. And then 2018 was an interesting time. You mentioned I was on the, uh, I was the chairman of the ACC Homelessness Task Force, and it was really a time of great acceleration in our efforts and the efforts in the county, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, number one, we got sued. That'll accelerate your efforts. And we got before Judge Carter, <clears throat> along with um, uh, Orange and Anaheim and the County of Orange. And at the time, we thought, how dare anybody sue us? We're, put, we're doing all these efforts. But in fact, 
it turned out to be the best thing for the city of Costa Mesa. It's through that that we developed this uh, shelter. And um, it was in 2018, because of the kind of accelerant or the impetus of the lawsuit, that we started to look into shelters. Also, the city of Boise case came down for the Ninth Circuit in 2018 that said, you can't enforce your anti-camping ordinances if you don't have shelter beds. So we went to work to develop a shelter beds uh, in 2018. We did a lot of work in that, in that regard. And then in 2019, we had a new council and we had a new directly elected mayor uh, who's now our supervisor, Katrina Foley. And uh, we, we had different options for our shelter and uh, uh, supervisor then Mayor Foley and I was the mayor pro tem at the time and Larry Haynes from Mercy House got together at the golf course one day and we hashed out our ideas about what this shelter program would look like and it pretty much looks like that. Uh, we executed on that. Um, we started with in, in 2019 we uh, um, it started with the temporary shelter on the west side of Costa Mesa at the Lighthouse Church run by Mercy House. That opened in April of 2019, and that was while we built our permanent shelter. Our permanent shelter, as it turned out, is on Airway Avenue in Costa Mesa, right off of Red Hill. We bought a building for $7 million. We funded that building, the acquisition of that building through general funds, actually through our reserves, and then we built that building out. It cost us about $4 million to build out that building. We got it from different sources. We, we got um, uh, uh, $2.35 million from the county. Thank you very much, County of Orange. We appreciate that. $1.4 million to build out was from the um, city of Newport Beach. The city of Newport Beach is our partner in the bridge shelter. It's a 70-bed shelter. It's 12,400 12, square feet, um, and Newport Beach has 10 beds, as, and, and they pay a million dollars a year, and they paid $1.4 million to help us build out the shelter. As a result of the work that we did to, to, to bring the shelter together, um, we were able to get a court order from Judge Carter that allows us to enforce our anti-encampment ordinances. That's been a blessing. We heard from a, a previous panel about the work that's being done by the county at Talbert Park. And again, thank you for the $3.6 million grant to do that. Um, that would not have been possible had we not gotten that federal court order because we wouldn't have been able to enforce our anti-encampment laws without uh, non-compliance with the city of Boise case. So um, where we are at now with the shelter is it's a permanent shelter. It's in place. We've gotten through the pandemic uh, by the grace of God for the most part. It, it currently costs us $3.55 million to run our homelessness program. And that includes payment to, um, to Mercy House. And also the food, the food is spectacular at our bridge shelter. We have Bracken's Kitchen there. We just last night approved an annual um, contract with them for $375,000 to provide the food. They not only provide the food, but also a vocational program for the residents of the shelter to learn how to get into the culinary field. It's really quite something. We get a million dollars a year uh, from the city of Newport Beach. We get approximately $850,000 from SB2 funds. The, so that leaves our annual nut that we have to cover for the shelter operations, and that includes our outreach team and, the, uh, and, and all the outside uh, uh, resources of $1.7 million. We have our shelter is a hybrid method, which is unique. And by hybrid, what I mean is we have the we have a Mercy House, which is our outside, um, our, our outside uh, uh, vendor that operates. And then we also have our city staff. And uh, we devote about $1, $1 million to the city staff. And of course, that includes, again, our code enforcement operator, officer, rather, Mike Brumbaugh, and uh, social workers and our, our uh, police unit. <laughs> So we've got, uh, so we've talked about now the costs. You may have some further questions about that. 
We have a housing first model. It's low barrier entry. We focus on getting people in and getting people housing as quickly as possible. Um, we have housed in, uh, it, it, since we started this effort in and opened the temporary shelter in April of 2019, we've housed 215 people. Our, our current census at the shelter is 64 people. So that's 279 people that are not homeless, that would otherwise be homeless if not for these efforts. And so that's quite something. Um, we have very few encampments, if any, in the city of Costa Mesa because we're able to enforce and we have that community policing unit to do that. Now we have the resources of the county at Talbert Park. Talbert Park is an interesting deal in the sense that um, you know, it's the county property and there were so many encampments there that they actually had a city of their own. They called it the jungle and they had their own mayor. It was, it was quite something. And Judge Carter went out there, uh, uh, Supervisor Foley, when she was the mayor, she went out there and observed what was going on there. It was quite uh, a threat to the, the people that were living there and also it was a concern for the residents and also a fire hazard too because there's, it's dry there. Um, but now we can enforce our ordinances both in Talbert Park and in the city. Um, I think I've covered everything that I want to cover. I just want to say that, you know, for cities that are thinking about embarking on this, I, um, I felt really kind of bad when we voted on uh, the temporary shelter because back in 2017, 2018, I think we kind of feared the public. We feared that they would come out with pitchforks if we tried to address this issue directly, if we tried to put in a shelter. Um, mayor Foley, when she, or sorry, Supervisor Foley, when she was the mayor and Arliss Reynolds, literally went door to door in the rain to talk to people to get them to support this initiative and the work that we're doing. And when we eventually um, uh, passed it, to our surprise, it was welcomed by the community and we didn't have any pitchforks and people trusted the work that we're, do we're doing and we have had good outcomes. But it's becoming more difficult as the uh, uh, wound walk um, representative said, I'm told it's a, it, it, you mentioned the low hanging fruit. We're now dealing with the more difficult population, uh, a population which has a greater percentage of drug, drug abuse and mental illness than we did at the beginning. And so our outcomes are, are harder to achieve now. So we could use all the help we can get uh, funding, prayers, whatever we can, because this is a, a really a God's work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stevens. I might have some questions, but I'll save them for um, after all the other mayors have presented and appreciate your insights and comments here today, especially as it relates to the cost. So what I wrote down was that it's still costing the city of Costa Mesa $1.7 million out of the general fund to uh, address homelessness and services. And so I'll just repeat what my opinion is. I'm one of five up here, but my opinion is that this is a county role to provide the funding for uh, mental health services, for um, homelessness services, for the cities that are not the top 15 and that don't get any funding at all from the state. And so, um, I appreciate that uh, data. Okay, moving on to Mayor Kemp from Laguna Beach. Mayor Kemp, can you provide us your insights and what your city is working on? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Foley, and I appreciate you convening this panel of mayors this can morning. Can you push, pull your microphone up a little bit? There we go. So I'm just gonna go through a few things. First, in our current shelter operations, we have the alternate sleeping location, which we call the ASL. It's a low barrier emergency shelter for homeless individuals in Laguna Beach. The ASL is a housing-focused enrollment program offering 30-day renewable increments of time to homeless individuals actively pursuing a housing plan. The enrollment program operates daily from 5 p.m. to 10 a.m. the following morning and serves about 45 participants. The city contracts with our Friendship Shelter to op operate the city's shelter. 
The city's homeless program costs $1 million and is funded by the city's general fund with some off offsets for, by grant funding. We get about $400,000 as passed through from the county. A homeless shelter has been in Laguna Beach since the late 1980s. That was through our friendship shelter. Um, and like John mentioned, there's nothing like getting sued to get you moving. And in 2009, the city opened the alternate sleeping location to address its unsheltered program. The city was initially had a nightly lottery-based program, and, but then in 2019, the program was modified to an enrollment-based program. And once again, that was for getting people in for 30 days and hoping, hoping to get them moved out and into um, some supportive housing. The ASL is the only low barrier emergency shelter in uh, South Orange County, as um, Supervisor Foley mentioned. Challenges to operating the ASL and homeless programs in 2022 are as follows. Assess successfully operating a low barrier emergency shelter during and after the pandemic. Obviously problems there. Navigating Boise and other legal challenges. Equitable distrib distribution of managing homelessness in the region and ensuring that the regional policies and funding continue to support existing municipal shelters. And the third section of this I want to talk about is this, the city uh, supports funding a regional solution to ending homelessness provided that all agencies in the region are part of the process. It is a regional problem. ASL is not and cannot be the SPA since it will a, increase the cost significantly to the city's operating costs and lawsuits, impact city's public services, and does not promote a regional South County solution to ending homelessness in Orange County. We're a 23,000 resident community. We cannot be the spa and we cannot be the entry point. Um, just as a point of note, in 2009, 75% of the participants uh, in the ASL um, were you know, associated with Laguna Beach. In other words, we knew them well. Now today, only 15% have a link to the community. So it tells you a couple of things. One is, you know, we're successfully housing some of those people and moving them along, but more and more we're getting people that um, are just coming from outside the community. It's the city of Laguna Beach hope that the county can work with other South County cities to build service infrastructure, such as emergency shelters, addiction treatment centers, and mental health facilities. So just a couple things anecdotally. So we have Mission Hospital in Laguna Beach, obviously we call Big Mission, which is in Mission Viejo. We have a smaller Mission Hospital in Laguna Beach. And we have, that's the 5150 site for South County, and we get a lot of homeless people in there. And the problem is, I think, as the Wounded Warrior representative mentioned, that we get people in there. They're obviously in there for 72 hours. They get out. Where do they go? If there's no beds available, they're just released and oftentimes into our community. It causes so much disruption and un, uh, so much unhappiness and, and consternation by our residents. You know, we haven't talked about law enforcement. I know we have a law enforcement person here from Santa Ana, but uh, in 2020, our previous council, I was on the council at the time, but it was our um, the previous council, went to the district attorney and said, we have about 20 chronic um, people who are con constantly breaking the law and have not been, have not been detained. And this, these people were arrested over 20 times. And so we gave that list of names to the district attorney. They gave us our own person to deal with in the district attorney's office. And so when, when one of these people commits yet another crime, these people are returned over to this, our special district attorney um, uh, resource. And some of these people have gone to prison. So um, there's the law enforcement piece of that, which is important to our community, because people wonder, you know, what are, you, what are we actually doing about these people that are continually arrested? Um, and I also noticed that in COVID, as we, you know, the severity of COVID has kind of dropped off, people are getting more mobile again, and people are going to different cities and doing a lot of things. And I'm getting a lot of feedback now, like, uh, you know, Sue, I went to Venice, overrun by homeless. I had to get someone to guard my car. I went to L.A., what a disaster. Uh, I went to Marina del Rey, horrible. And San Francisco, you know, as, as we know, all these areas are just overrun. And what they're doing now is... When they were previously more, I wouldn't say accepting homeless, the homeless people that they see down on, for instance, our main beach, now they're pointing out to me, hey, I see 10 homeless people down there and some drug transactions going on down there. So we have people, so we're doing a lot of arresting, you know, and getting, trying to clean that up. The other thing we've had to do down there is 
We have at night in the main beach area, we have hired security guards and we um, spent about $100,000 now a quarter additionally to get those people, you know, out of there and not sleeping in storefront window in storefront cutouts and things like that. So, you know, we're trying our best based on, you know, the resources that we have. We have in our police department, we have outreach officers. They're very actively working with the homeless. They know most of these homeless people. We've sent people home via bus tickets. We've given some people plane tickets. We've called and tried to find their relatives to, you know, hook them back up with their families. But, you know, at this point, we, we do need, we need county support. We need a lot of money. And when, you th when I think about homelessness, I think we need to address it in segments. These people who are chronically mentally ill, who are frankly, a lot of these people, in my view, are not going to recover, they need a place to be. And then we have the drug addiction, drug, drug addicted people, they need a place to recover. So, and then we have, of course, people who are just situational, situationally homeless. But I understand it's a complicated problem, but I think we need to focus, when we focus our money and resources, we need to for, focus in these particular segments. Thank you for those excellent insights. And um, I'll save my questions until after we hear from Mayor Sarmiento. Mayor Sarmiento. Yes, uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Supervisor Foley. Let me begin by also uh, thanking, you know, my fellow mayors for being here and for being on the front lines. We know that mayors, you know, during a pandemic, during, uh, you know, a homeless uh, spikes, uh, we're, we're kind of on the front lines, as you know, as being a former mayor yourself. And, you know, I got to say, we're right across the street. You know, our city hall is literally, literally across the street. This is one of the few times I've been invited to discuss this issue. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it speaks to the leadership that's now present here uh, uh, while you're here. So I want to thank you because I think uh, we can do a lot in partnership. Um, and, uh, you know, it just speaks to the severity of the problem that it's not going to take one city or one supervisor, it's agencies and all our resources. And I'll speak at a high level because I, you know, as you all know, it's always great to have people that are more intelligent than you that can speak to this. And that's why I brought uh, uh, Ken Gaminsky with us, which will be sharing a, a PowerPoint with you all. But um, I did want to let uh, you, know, you know that, um, to your point, I think Santa Ana is, is uniquely uh, challenged by this uh, issue with people experiencing homelessness. It is the county seat, so a lot of the services that are provided to our you know, homeless population are, are located here, so we have an extra challenge. Uh, uh, we also have uh, issues like having, you know, hosting the men's central jail here in Santa Ana, uh, as well as the, uh, the um, uh, homeless shelter, the county's homeless shelter on Yale Street, which is on the west end of town. Um, what, we've, what we do is we expend over $20 million of um, our general fund money to address homelessness, and that's despite receiving money from the state, right? Um, so we receive that as being one of the 13th largest cities in the state. We do receive some direct funding um, from the governor's office. Unfortunately, that's just not enough. Uh, you know, we stood up a, a temporary shelter called the Link um, in about 28 days when things were really uh, out of control a few years. And we're days away, literally, from opening our permanent uh, shelter, which is going to be our homeless navigation center on Carnegie. And that's on the east end of town. But I think what we all are here to talk about is the relationship that local governments and, and, and municipal governments have with their county. The county is obviously the agency vested with this responsibility to address um, social service issues like this. Uh, and I think we could get much further having this relationship, having a positive um, uh, communication uh, effort, and that's been lacking, you know, quite frankly for us. So, uh, as I said, we haven't had these conversations or else we probably would have done much more to address the problem, but um, it's never too late. And I think right now where we are is, um, you know, what I have conversations with the other big city mayors like in San Francisco and San Diego and Los Angeles is that we're spending literally billions of dollars in capital improvements to create temporary shelters and, you know, other continuums of, of housing, but we now are struggling with actual placements, right? So now folks that are, uh, that we do have resources to, 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 to house folks in, folks are refusing, right? So th that's why I know that the governor's office is working with some of the state, state legislators, specifically, I believe, uh, uh, Senator Eggman on a package of bills, and uh, he's looking at, you know, care courts, right, to see how we can encourage 
um, you know, services for folks that are resistant because we'll, we have uh, many encampments here in the city, unfortunately, because we have an extensive rail system where uh, we don't have jurisdiction over, but we have, um, you know, rail authorities that do. Uh, and we just have a very large city where um, encampments tend to build up. We try to break down, but um, unfortunately they just happen. Um, and I think that when you're talking about the intersection of law enforcement and local government, I think what's been mentioned here previously is also the intersection with the judicial bench. We know that, um, you know, federal, uh, federal district court uh, judge uh, David Carter is a very conspicuous presence in all of our, uh, you know, uh, local governments and, you know, in the county. And he has taken on, you know, uh, uh, that role of helping us navigate this. But we certainly believe that um, we need to see uh, how we can avoid litigation. And uh, unfortunately, the city of Santa Ana has had to litigate with the county uh, previously just because we felt that um, we are uh, having to shoulder a lot of the responsibility of um, this regional problem. But I think with, you know, the 33 other cities, and we have examples of uh, extremely good actors here that realize that if all, if we all do uh, some portion of this, we can tackle this. We can we can certainly put a dent in it. And having the county as our partner, uh, you know, I'm very optimistic and hopeful. So um, uh, with that, I just want to you know uh, kind of leave this in, in uh, Ken Gaminsky's hands. I apologize. I'm going to have to uh, leave a little early because I have another engagement. But uh, Ken is formally law enforcement. So uh, it, Ken serves as our uh, homeless service manager, and he oversees our quality of life team, our homeless evaluation assessment response team, and our Santa Ana multidisciplinary uh, homeless response team. And, uh, you know, he was uh, with us at the department for over 35 years as an officer. He, he retired just recently as a deputy chief, and he literally is on the front lines working directly with Judge Carter and uh, his staff to see how we can better address this issue. But, um, you know, most, you know, importantly, I think what Ken is, uh, his role has, has been uh, helping with is transitioning us away from having the first encounter with folks going through crisis and those that are experiencing homelessness and having a civilian professional team to address that problem. And obviously we know that there are some folks that are dangerous, as was mentioned. Mm. We obviously support that with our police. But whenever an issue can be addressed with um, a team that's professionally trained for this, and many of our officers just aren't. Uh, you know, that's not what they uh, signed up for. Unfortunately, the, the responsibility has been relegated to them because mm -hmm. there is no other resource. So I think with Ken and with some of our efforts to bring on uh, civilian teams, we can, you know, uh, have that first encounter be a much more positive encounter rather than an adversarial or hostile one. So um, that's where we hope to get to, and that's where I think, um, you know, our aspiration is here. But mo most importantly, I just want to thank you for this space because look, this just hasn't been done. So that's why it's sort of a foreign environment to be able to speak about these issues now uh, directly. And I just want to thank you for creating the uh, time and space for all of us to be here, Supervisor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Gomensky. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, do you have the PowerPoint or no? We'll assume not. We'll move forward. So today, I'm interested in discussing with you the changing roles of law enforcement. So when the homeless crisis hit law enforcement, the city of Santa Ana, just like most cities, relied on law enforcement to address it. Shortly thereafter, law enforcement learned that we could not arrest ourselves out of this problem. We learned that responding to the same homeless individual over and over was a poor use of stretched police resources. Many cities created homeless liaison officers. However, the city of Santa Ana had a very large problem and needed a bigger response. As an alternate concept, the Homeless Evaluation Assessment Response Team, HART, was formed. The program staffed by law enforcement officers focused exclusively on homeless individuals and families in an attempt to address homelessness in its entirety through immediate needs and long-term effects. This meant that the created team of eight officers and a supervisor was tasked with addressing homelessness in Santa Ana citywide. All police personnel working on this detail received specifically designed mental health training, 
which was crisis intervention training for law enforcement as a beginning step. And then the training grew from there. As the Santa Ana Police Department got further into addressing the crisis, we learned that homelessness is a very complex and intricate issue, which requires civic collaboration with a variety of sources, including faith-based organizations, nonprofit agencies, volunteers, and other stakeholders. We also learned many of the individuals encountered suffered from a myriad of mental health issues, substance abuse, and physical challenges, up to and including individuals that had some type of medical issue that precluded them from going to shelter or precluded them from transitioning on as they wished. Collaborations with public, private, nonprofit entities were established. This partnership allowed police officers the opportunity to aid the homeless and provide viable options in an emphasis on self-sufficiency, which assisted them in obtaining housing. Hard officers provided outreach and engagement to individuals on the streets of Santa Ana by not just directing them to the appropriate agency, including emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, or transitional housing, but hard officers were directed to work with the homeless and say, what do you need? I need a ride to go to my medical appointment. Hop in the car, I'll take you. I can't get document ready because I don't have my driver's license or a proof of uh, residency. Fine, hop in the car, let's go. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Officers worked hand in hand with the homeless population which was a truly different idea for law enforcement because law enforcement had routinely and consistently been seen only as that enforcement mechanism. But we altered that in our first iteration with Hart. After Hart came Colt. That's the quality of life team. I happened to be over at the old Santa Ana YMCA in about 2018. I had gotten a call from the mayor's office, uh, the city hall, about a homeless person that was there. Went over, sat down, talked to that individual for about an hour, and that individual finally decided they'd like to go to shelter. It's a good day. Any day they make the decision, it's a good day. So I had a homeless individual who had decided that this property here, we'll say, was uh, something that we were going to take with him. And he happened to have probably, I don't know, four dumpsters worth of trash that he had surrounded himself with. So uh, I called Public Works. And as the deputy chief of police, I usually get a pretty good response. I called Public Works, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited, and I waited. And three hours later, a public works unit showed up, and they cleaned up the four dumpsters full of trash. And uh, we got the individual housed into the shelter. But I got a little upset about that and thought, my gosh, if the deputy chief is treated this way, the regular officers that are just out here trying to address these issues... It's got to be driving them nuts. But more importantly, what a huge waste of resources. So I contacted Public Works and I said, can you fix the problem? They said, we have the exact same problem when we need to do a cleanup, but we can't get a hold of your officers. Hmm. Okay. Great. Out of that, Colt was born. The Santa Ana Police Department combined efforts with Public Works, Park and Rec, Code enforcement, the city attorney's office, and every day at 8 o'clock, a team comprised of those entities shows up at our city yard. Law enforcement for the San Ana Police Department takes the lead. Overnight, there is a series of uh, requests that come, on, come in via the My Santa Ana app or phone calls left on messages of locations where either homeless individuals 
uh, are currently encamped or just miscellaneous debris generally left over behind individuals that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, subsequently, that group comes together, and as a team, they move from location to location to location. If there is a homeless individual there, the County of Orange provides its Orange County mental health care workers that are actually also part of the team, and they will contact homeless individuals, offer them shelter, offer them uh, opportunities for help. Public Works is there to clean up any debris, trash, or public safety concerns as far as what's left. Park and Rec is responsible to go through all of the property, all of the property, and ensure that what is trash or what is property that needs to be stored for 90 days. Code enforcement is part of the team because we found that when you go out to the same location over and over Generally, there is some kind of partnership that the city should be establishing with that property owner to fix whatever the uh, reason these individuals keep coming back onto this private property. Code enforcement then finds the issues and immediately responds with some type of correspondence and action with the property owner. Lastly, the city attorney's office is involved in this. Uh, as stated by the mayor, we have some very, very difficult locations. We find ourselves uh, struggling with uh, railroads. Uh, we have quite a bit of railroad in our city, and that is private property. So we have, in fact, been forced to uh, file lawsuits to get reactions from some property owners. As an example, in February... The quality of life team responded to 436 incidents in the month. They cleaned up 399 locations. They issued 128 citations for various different things. But they placed 60 individuals in shelter. What Colt allows is for an individual business uh, resident who has an issue or problem at a specific location they get a response from the city that is a complete response, not just a removal of debris, not just a removal of a person, but it's a holistic response to, you had a problem, we found there was an issue, we've addressed it. However, this too is tremendously taxing on city resources. Tremendously taxing. <clears throat> the city has now... Uh, transition to what we call, we still have Colt, but we now also have something called SMART. This, uh, s this program was based on a program with uh, Anaheim and CityNet. Santa Ana's newly formed SMART program is a pilot program started uh, back last December. When residents have a concern or a complaint regarding homelessness, they need help or requesting help for a person experiencing homelessness, they can either call a number or report it via the My Santa Ana app. If they call the Santa Ana Police Department, that number is then transferred to CityNet, our partner, who mans a live dispatch center. My Santa Ana City apps requesting services are also sent to that same dispatch center and CityNet provides teams with trauma-informed care at the forefront to go out and address any homeless-related issues that do not require a mandatory police response. Meaning, if there's just a homeless individual on the corner of walk and don't walk, that is not a law enforcement response because, pol because being homeless is not a crime. However, by using this SMART program, we can send specific individuals who are trained and routinely interact with the homeless population to establish a rapport, to go out there time after time, because it may take 20 times of contacting somebody who's homeless 
before they will take that next step and take that chance. But you have to develop that rapport. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gaminski, and um, really appreciate your insights. Um, I'm watching the time, and we are now 18 minutes behind. We were four, now we're 18 minutes. <laughs> uh, but we will we'll move it along. And so I have a couple of questions for all the panelists. One, um, do you have anti-loitering and anti-encampment ordinances in each of your cities? Yes, we do in Costa Mesa. Okay. Yes, I think so. Yes. Okay, and then Santa Ana? Yes, we do. Okay. And then um, briefly, could each of you discuss whether there's any exacerbation of homelessness in your communities, especially as it relates to um, individuals who might have addiction issues from a, a concentration of sober living homes? Well, you know, obviously that's been a topic in Costa Mesa for a long time, and we just... <laughs> Uh, won a federal jury um, case earlier this week where we defended our ordinances and that was a very uh, uh, serious problem uh, for a long period of time it's um, it's gotten a lot better because of the um, ordinances we've put in place and the rules and regulations that we have Im imposed on the sober living homes it's still an issue it's hard to really say I think uh, th we definitely have uh, people that are addicted on the streets. Uh, um, uh, we're hearing l fewer complaints about those being linked to sober living homes than we did back in uh, 2004, 2005, sorry, 2014, 15, 16, and 17 before we started to implement our ordinances. Okay, Mayor Kempf, I know you mentioned that um, in 2009, 69% of the residents in the shelter were Laguna Beach residents, and now you're down to, I think you said, 15%. Is there any correlation between that and any sober living home? No, I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> um, and uh, Mr. Gaminski, do you have any issues with regard to uh, detox centers or sober living homes in the city of Santa Ana and any curbing that's occurring and exacerbating homelessness? So I can speak personally, when I was in the field, when Costa Mesa was experiencing its difficulties with people who would drop out of detox and then become homeless, uh, the city of Santa Ana got more than its fair share of the people that crossed the border and came north. Well, what about now? I'm talking about now. Uh, <laughs> we still have some, but that is not our biggest problem. Okay. And the reason I'm talking about now is because the, the City of Costa Mesa ordinance requires that a person get transitioned, uh, a point of contact be call, called, or that the county be called so that they aren't just curbed. So hopefully it's working. Uh, okay, and then you mentioned, Mr. Kaminsky, a phone number, but you didn't say what the phone number was. What's the phone number that residents can call um, if they are concerned about encampments? That's a great question but I don't have it in my notes right now. Okay, well let's get that and we'll post that for our um, viewing public. And then do other cities have a phone number or a contact? My Santa Ana app is a really good resource. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other resources for your cities? Mayor Kim? Yeah, I think we just they just call the police department resource officers. Okay. So we have a My Costa Mesa app as well. Um, that's a good resource. And then I'm trying to remember you probably know it. It's uh, it's seven uh, seven one four seven five four, and I think it's two five two five. Is it two five two five? I don't think that's the number anymore. But uh, yeah, okay. I don't I don't want to give the wrong number. I don't want, don't, <laughs> don't don't I don't know what the number is. <laughs> okay, but we'll find it, out. I, I know I got the first six digits right. Okay, um, okay. So I have just a couple more questions. So. Local law enforcement sounds like in each of your cities uh, is spending a, a lot of time addressing issues uh, because the residents are calling, businesses are calling. Um, would you agree that this undermines the ability to uh, effectuate public safety efforts in areas that aren't related to homelessness but are actually you know, related to crime? Yes. Okay. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we don't have, you know, we're once again, we're a small city. And so when we have a couple officers tied up with homelessness issues all day long, that's, that's calls that can't, other calls that are not answered in our city. 
So the number you gave us was you you said you said that you spend about a million dollars. The county has some kind of a grant that you get for four hundred thousand, so that's six hundred thousand dollars for the shelter. But you also had a hundred thousand dollars that you are using for some kind of security guards. So that totals seven hundred thousand out of your general fund, and then that doesn't include the law enforcement services. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Mayor Stevens, any? Yeah, yeah any it do, definitely does. So I, I just got these statistics from our police chief. So in 2021, we had almost 4,000 calls for service relating to homelessness. Uh, that There were up about 1,200 arrests, uh, 141 shelter referrals, uh, 150 assists by our community policing unit with um, transportation and 220 referrals to detox and recovery. So we have, I, I, I think we're up to seven <clears throat> officers on our um, C, uh, um, community policing unit. So it does, it does occupy a lot of the police officers' time. So the 1.7 million that you referred to earlier that is out of the general fund and not covered by any particular grant, does that include the seven police officers? I don't think so. Okay. Okay, and Mr. Kaminsky, do you have any data that um, might enlighten us as to the the cost of, of law enforcement as it relates to these issues? As of a couple of years ago, about 17% of all the calls for service received by the San Antonio Police Department had a nexus to homelessness. It's also important to remember that although law enforcement there's a cost to law enforcement and public safety. There's also a cost to the fire departments as they have to respond for different types of issues, right? We very rarely talk about the expenses that the fire departments are incurring, but they're there. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you for raising that as well. Uh, paramedic services especially. And you now have Orange County Fire Authority for Santa Ana, but each of the other two cities are, you have your own fire departments mm -hmm. with your own paramedics. Um, my, my final question really is, um, what can the county do better to serve the needs of the cities? Mayor Stevens? Well, um, funding is always great. And, and I mean, we, we also have to acknowledge the, um, and, and appreciate the funding that we received for building the shelter and the, fun, the funding that we, we we're receiving for cleaning up Talbert Park. Um, but the one thing we have not talked about uh, yet, and that is uh, permanent supportive housing. And uh, just uh, several months ago, we were right here, and you did a presentation on the Home Key project. And so we've put in an application for two Home Key uh, projects, uh, one, uh, two, two uh, motels that we would uh, uh, switch from a motel to permanent supportive housing. So more of that is important. I was just talking to Larry Haynes on the way here. He, uh, of course, is the executive director of Mercy House. And he says one of the biggest problems that we're having with homelessness is just the throughput of taking people th through our shelter program and then having a place for them to go. And so uh, you mentioned previously in one of the panels the 2,700 permanent supportive housing uh, goal, and I think we just need to do whatever we can to achieve that and even go beyond that um, because we need uh, permanent supportive housing and also, as a corollary to that, affordable housing uh, so that more people don't fall into homelessness. We should all be working on that across the board, state, county, and municipal, and the private sector to try to... Uh, improve the affordability of shelter in our community. Thank you, Mayor Stevens. Uh, Mayor Kemp, any um, final comments about what the county can do better to serve the needs of the cities? Yeah, I think, you know, our police department's really not trained in mental health services, and so, you know, maybe funding Be Well for us would be a, a start, but the bottom line is these people, you know, even if they get the counseling they need or they have mental health, um, you know, professionals helping them, th there has to be a place for them to go. And if we don't build some mental health facilities for some of these people, I don't, I don't, I don't see us getting around a lot of these problems because these people, a lot of these pro people, are chronically mentally ill. 
So I think support for at least for counseling to start and as long as we can get the county to start building some mental health facilities, that would be probably the best, I think Thank the best you. path. Well, we are working on the Be Well site at the Irvine campus, which is at the Great Park and that will serve the South Spa service planning area. So we're hopeful that that will be um, a, a new resource, but that's a couple years from now. Um, Mr. Kaminsky, any final thoughts about what the county can do better to serve the needs? And, and I'll, I'll just also say that thank you for all your efforts. Um, and I would like to ask that you take, pay special attention to Angel's Playground or Angel's Park. Angel's Park. Yeah, Angel's Park. Angel's Playground is in Costa Mesa. Angel's Park in Santa Ana. Um, I, you know, I drive past there every day and I am concerned that it has an increase in uh, people encamping there. The community cannot use that park at all. Um, and I have asked our county office to where we can to engage. And so um, anything that we can do better to help serve uh, Santa Ana? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first and foremost, a reevaluation of the placement by the county for the cold weather shelter. The city of Santa Ana gets the opportunity to be the location for the cold weather shelter every year. However, there are armories all throughout the county, and the city of Santa Ana should not be the only person, the only entity that gets this opportunity. Point well taken. I have the phone number. Can I do the phone number? Yes. What's the phone number? Okay, it's a seven one four. This is the non-emergency uh, dispatch number, 714-754-5255. Okay, 714-754-5255 and uh, my Santa Ana app, my and Costa Mesa app. Second, if I could just echo Mayor Skimps? Yeah. Kemp. Kemp's uh, discussion about mental health beds. From a person who has been out in the field, from a person like who has walked these streets like Wound Walk, um, it is incredibly frustrating when you find somebody who is in dire need of that mental health bed, right? Um, and we then transition them to a 72-hour hold location that generally only holds them for sometimes 24 hours at best and may or may not be in a position to get them their medication that they need and then releases them back. And the city of Santa Ana is lucky enough to be close enough to the Orange Hospitals to get those people and our own hospitals that do this type of work. We truly need a better mental health solution for beds, and we need a much better mental health solution on a day-to-day. -day. And then lastly, and I'm done, the uh, detox is a huge issue. But what they said earlier about that warm handoff would make almost all the, different in the difference in the world. Once you get somebody to decide to make that change, we have to do everything we can to encourage them along that path and remove those roadblocks so they can continue to have success. It is so heroic when these people decide to make a change, we have to have their back. I think that's a that's a very fair point, um, and because if if there's even a three hour delay in uh, finding a place for someone to transfer from detox into uh, housing, you lose that person, and mm -hmm. then you just start the cycle all over again. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists for being here and providing us this important um, information, these insights from your cities. We appreciate your time today, and we're going to move on to panel number four. Okay, panel number four, Mayor Shaver, if you want to go ahead and take a seat at the um, on the dais or on the at the seat at the panel here, and Richard Owens, uh, Dr. Sorrells. And Bex Hayho. We'll go Mayor Schauber, and then R Richard, and then um, <clears throat> Bex at the end, and then Shantina next to Bex. Our next panel is on opportunities and solutions. 
The goal of our final panel is to focus on some short and medium term opportunities for us to pursue. Um, we did talk about some opportunities with the last panel, so that's helpful. Um, but I'm pleased to introduce you to this exceptional group of panelists who work every day to reduce homelessness and help people here in Orange County. Mayor Shaver is the mayor for the city of Stanton. I first got to know Mayor Shaver when I was, um, during the pandemic actually, and all the mayors were getting together on calls, but also when I uh, joined the board here last year, we partnered together on numerous projects. Um, he has led and delivered results on behalf of his community for years. Under his leadership, Stanton has been the model city in taking advantage of Project Room Key and now Project Home Key to convert crime-ridden motels into permanent supportive housing. I was proud to partner with Mayor Shaver and our great county team to successfully move two projects forward. And as we will discuss, I see motel conversions as the most cost-effective way to create permanent supportive housing. And I think many city leaders will learn from the mayor's insights. We also have Richard Owens. As a Marine veteran, Richard Owens is committed to ending veterans' homelessness in Orange County. As a sister of a veteran, I share this commitment. Richard serves as chair of the Housing Working Group for the Orange County Veterans and Military Families Collaborative. He also works as a senior program manager for supportive services at Jamboree Housing. Thank you, Richard, for joining us. And then we have Dr. Shantina Sorrells, a champion for our most vulnerable youth. Dr. Shantina Sorrell serves as Chief Program Officer for the Orangewood Foundation. She holds a master's and doctorate in social work. Dr. Sorrell is certified in trauma-informed training and has been a, train, a trainer of trauma-informed practices for various Orange County establishments. Dr. Sorrell also serves as Chair of the Orange County Continuum of Care Transitional Age Youth Committee. We look forward to her recommendations regarding youth homelessness. And then finally, we have Bex Hayhoe. When it comes to homelessness in Orange County, Bex Hayhoe needs no introduction. She works tirelessly uh, as the executive director under the United to End Homelessness at Orange County United Way. Before that, I knew her from her work with Trellis in Costa Mesa. Bex provides tremendous insight to me, my team, and the entire community. She delivers results, and since 2019, Bex and her team have found 608 people housing. That's 405 households. Bex also serves on the Continuum of Care Board and is currently the vice chair. So let's start with Mayor Shaver. Mayor Shaver, please share with us your insights and your successes related to Project Home Key. Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Foley. Um, it's been my pleasure working with you as my district supervisor, but unfortunately, we got redistrict and you got district out. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I found the first panel very interesting, or I, maybe it was number three, <laughs> because I lived through that because we started back in the year 2012. So uh, it was interesting to see historically uh, how things have progressed throughout the county on programs that actually uh, got some of their start in our community. When we talk about affordable housing, we talk about different stages of productivity. Uh, one of the bottom lines is, as we go through this, is funding. And, you know, there's a lot of funding out there, but acquiring that funding uh, oftentimes is very difficult. I think the best thing you can do in order to get started is to find out what your needs are. And once you find out what those needs are, then you have to go out and find the resources. Uh, there are so many countless agencies that are willing to assist you that are nonprofits that can establish the program. But then you also have to work with people like developers, uh, people that are going to do building, construction, uh, and then management. One of the things I learned in my first uh, rodeo was um, we signed on to uh, not pay too much for the uh, particular uh, building, but they ended up getting us the bill for uh, ongoing costs, operational costs. 
I found that operational costs were far more than uh, what the cost of the building was. So I, a lesson well learned. Uh, we, began, we began back uh, with the governor's opportunity for us to uh, receive some funding. Uh, that began um, back in, uh, I think it was almost two and a half years ago. Uh, and then when the money first became available, uh, we took the Stanton Inn and Suites. And at that time, we were the only city that really stepped up to the plate to do that. Um, just about uh, Laguna Woods and some of the others were uh, pushing back. But we felt it would necessitate itself um, if somebody took the lead and began the program. So Stanton stepped up. Uh, we had a 72 units at the Stanton Inn and Suites. And... What we wanted to do at that time, it was very simple. We wanted to take those that needed it that were elderly or high risk from COVID and on the streets and find them a place to temporarily stay. It was very challenging because um, we had at that time over 300 people living on tents on four of our major streets in our city. So we're trying to convince um, uh, for others to help us at the same time control our homeless situation on our railroad tracks with Union Pacific Railroad and on our streets. We were able to survive all that, as you know. Uh, today we have 39 that we're dealing with in this city of 40,000 people. The funding sources for our first project were a combination of a home key program, a Jamboree County, uh, Jamboree, the County of Orange, and, of course, the Stanton Housing Authority. And during that period of time, we were able to come up uh, with enough money uh, to fund the project. It was um, everything they said it was going to be. Uh, all my neighbors thought, or the residents thought, oh, my goodness, we're going to have this influx of, of horrible things happening uh, because we have this center. It turned out to be probably one of the best things that we did because it gave us a direction to go with these types of programs. Recently, uh, it was kind of interesting to find out that the Stanton Inn needed to be uh, some uh, uplifting or, you know, kind of go in there and do some uh, upgrading of it, facade-wise and roofing and things like that. And uh, we were able to uh, take care of that so there is going to be a maintenance cost uh, of the building besides purchasing the building, besides operation of the building. So those are your uh, three main components as you go through it. The uh, project now has gone from uh, room key, it's now home key, and uh, that's where we are with it right now. Uh, we're now moving it towards affordable housing, which is the next of the three primary steps. So you start with, well, we started with home key, I'm sorry, room key, you go to home key, you go to um, supportive housing, and then I'm going to give you uh, probably what's going to be the first innovative thing in the county, and that's permanent, permanent housing, or as we like to call it, um, housing that where somebody can feel that this is going to be their home for a long, long time. We then stepped up, and the next thing we moved to was the Tahiti Motel. And the Tahiti Motel uh, was our next venture. It was a combination of the Home Key Program, again, Jamboree Housing, County of Orange, and again, the Standing, Standing Housing Authority. Uh, we were very fortunate in getting that process done. We were awarded the financing for that. And that conversion is in the middle of taking place as we speak. If you recall, that is the site that you came out and visited. We were very excited about that. Uh, we, we found out that um, although it's very costly to do that, a city is going to end up saving a great deal of money. Uh, we were spending in public safety funds almost $900,000 a year with the 10 um, motels on Beach Boulevard. As you know, Stanton used to be called the crossroads of vacation land because everybody going from the mountains to the beach in the early days either stopped off for a chicken dinner with Cordelia Knott or for a, a bakery at our park pantry in Stanton. But it was kind of like a tourist way. 
Well, those motels, as you know, have fallen in disrepair, and the people that are staying there are not uh, really good citizens. Uh, a lot of them due to the fact that that was the only place they could afford to stay. Uh, but as you know, we spent about a lot of money on drug dealing, meth labs, fires, prostitution, drug sales. I mean, it was just, I could give you a whole litany. So by going to, with these motels and converting them, it really was a blessing for us financially. Of course, the money that we paid to do it far outweighs what we were saving, but we were saving it, and we also made our city a lot safer, and it made our law enforcement a little bit easier, both for police and fire. Uh, from there, uh, as we moved on, uh, the city of Stanton then, uh, in partnership with you, the County of Orange, and Jamboree Housing then, uh, have been awarded $6 million uh, $70,000 in funding in round two of state home key program, and we acquired a 21-unit Riviera Motel. And it's very interesting because we actually bought the property between the Riviera and the Tahiti, and that's going to become a resource center for both sides, uh, where we'll put in job training, uh, we'll have a site for rehabilitation, medical, uh, people can go in there and for counseling, and we even have a dentist, it's going to have a dentist office there, much like what was going on with the Illumination Foundation in Fullerton. So it's going to be a much larger facility. So we're, it's going to be kind of a triage. It's going to have two uh, of these um, supportive housing units, uh, which are going to have a total of 122 rooms, and then a center for uh, services, which I'm very proud of. As we go on from there, I don't want to bore you with the, with the finances because we all know it costs a lot of money. But I will tell you our next goal uh, is to um, take this beyond uh, affordable, I'm sorry, between supportive housing and we're going to go with permanent housing. And I don't think anybody's ever done this before. You know, you usually have at market rate housing and that's separate and then somewhere in a, in a, in a more of a, a low cost area. I don't know how to describe it. I, I, I just call it in maybe the poor sections of a community. You put your affordable housing. Well, for the first time, we're going to be building a at market place unit with 208, 208 rooms right next door to an affordable housing unit, all brand new in the same area. Uh, so one's going to have 218, the other's going to have 208, so we end up with 426. The nice thing is, is the way we were able to work that is that we're working with uh, 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 many different agencies that are helping us with that. Uh, we are going to be going and asking for assistance um, from the Urban County funding, which allocated $5 million in the Home American Rescue Plan funding. Uh, it's going to be eligible for that type of use. Um, HUD does require the plan uh, use the, uh, our own ARP funding, which we're going to put into that. And then we're also going to be developing our plan and submitting it to the county. So because the county is looking at developing that program uh, at this time, and we want to be an integral part of that plan. The interesting thing, too, was as we went through developing this multi-phase uh, multi unit of both um, uh, at market rate and permanent housing, we found that uh, the amenities like swimming pools will be there. Everybody's going to have our shared community centers. Uh, we're going to have educational centers for the kids, schooling, and uh, it will be one unit again. And it's replacing what is a slummed area in our community, which is Tina Pacific, which we lost uh, the right to build that when we lost our redevelopment money about 10 years ago. We almost finished that project, but now we're going to bring it to fruition. Uh, that whole northeast quadrant of Stanton is going to be completely revitalized. Uh, we're putting in new shopping centers there, and uh, this new uh, housing takes over 12 acres. So we're very pleased with that at this time. Uh, some of the things that I would recommend is that 
if you are a city that on Beach Boulevard that has all of these motels or you have something that needs to be a more a, a positive thing for your community, I would say that affordable housing is the best way to go. At this time, our arena numbers are off the, off the scale of being compliant with the state. You know, we, we're probably 2,000 ahead of what we're supposed to do. Stanton has the most affordable housing in the county. Uh, we were the pioneers for modeling for outreach coordinators working with our sheriff's department. Uh, Nate Wilson, who is the czar of the Be Well Center and homelessness, was our former chief. Uh, Judge Carter uses our city as an example of how it's done the right way. And, uh, you know, I could go on. Uh, but basically, it's all the people that have helped us. You know, my city council has done an outstanding job with our staff. We worked well with the county. We've really got some great work with the state and our local uh, representatives, Sharon Quirk Silva, has been very helpful. Uh, we have gotten some help from the federal government. And so it's a kind of a, just a, a, a team effort. And so I can't say that any one person is responsible, but I will say that through our joint efforts, we will be able to continue this. It's my goal to take the remaining four motels uh, that I have in my community and make them uh, supportive housing at this time. And who knows that where it's gonna go from there. Um, I'm gonna kind of rest my case. <laughs> um, I will tell you that there's some things that I heard from the first panel that I think you should be aware of. The county needs to come up with an ID system for homeless people. Unless they have a criminal record, there's no record of them. And a lot of them get their driver's license stolen, their ID cards stolen. There's got to be a way in which, in order for them to get help, they have to have some kind of identification you either make that requirement less restrictive or you come up with a way to help people get an ID or make it easier for them to get an ID. If you're a homeless person or a transient on the street and you don't have an ID and nobody's helping you get one, then you're gonna stay right where you are. Of course, the other thing that we need to work on, of course, is that somehow the state of California or the county has to help with the only people left on my streets. They are people that are mentally ill they are drug addicted, alcohol, and the other one which we're beginning to address um, is by having our own prosecution team, because we have people with 100 tickets, and the courts aren't even looking at it. So we have to have enforcement. And so we're gonna try to have our own, um, our own prosecutor, much like Laguna is doing at this time. But unless we begin to enforce our laws, which is very difficult with us, uh, because we are under some restrictions because we contract with the Orange County Sheriff's Department and they do have their uh, parameters that we have to follow. Fortunately, because we're members of the North Spa originally, both with Buena Park and Placentia, we are able to enforce our anti-camping laws. It's just a matter of if you enforce them, then who's going to do what to it? And right now, it seems to be a dead end for us. I think that the future of California is the conversion of existing buildings. Uh, you have to remember that um, with SB9 as an example, you don't want to get caught in a situation where you're beginning to build all these new buildings and then who's going to take care of the infrastructure, the sewers, the electric, the water. So if you convert an older building, you're bringing it up to code, you're getting it for a better use, and you're providing the housing that the people of California need, especially here in Orange County. Anyway, thank you thank for the you, opportunity to be here today and have a, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Mayor Schauber. And I always offer uh, your uh, docent tour of the Stanton Motel Conversions because I do think it's a model that others can follow to not only clean up an area, but most importantly, create housing, permanent supportive housing, uh, and transitional housing for individuals either on the verge of homelessness or actually experiencing homelessness. So I know that if any cities or any uh, organizations would like to uh, get a tour of Stanton and the work that you've done there, I'm sure you would be available to do that. So thank you for all your work. And I did write down, you also mentioned the railroads. 
So what I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Renaghi to work on is how do we get a contact with the railroads? Because I heard that come up with the Santa Ana as well, and so maybe we need to have some conversations with our railroad partners. Yeah, I can help you with that, Supervisor. Okay. Uh, her name is Luby Valdez. I'll give you the information on that. I also know the CEO in Nebraska. We were working with Judge Carter on that project. Okay. I think that's something that can be very helpful. Uh, they're willing to help. You can actually, the county can get permits to go in and do what's known as beautification. Right. And that might be able to help you also. One Appreciate more thing on, on, you talked about what can we do. There, methadone, we have a methadone clinic in Stanton. It's regulated by the state and also the county and us. We found, unfortunately, that the people that are using it are the ones that are uh, maybe short a little bit of cash so they can't buy their drugs. So they go in and in the interim to get by, they get their, they get their uh, treatment and then they go right back out and then they, when they have the money, then they go back on their, or what they normally, whatever they're using. And I think that that needs to be monitored much closer. There needs to be an accountability and there needs to be somebody that's making sure that if it's a private, operation in the city that it's doing what it's supposed to do. The problem is, is that I don't think there's any accountability on how what they're giving them is being used for, and it's just like, oh, here it is, and then, you know, we see them out on the street, and then once they get enough money, they're right back on taking whatever they take. All right. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. That's very helpful. Okay, we're going to move on, and... Um um, try to catch up on time a little bit here. So, uh, Richard Owens, uh, great to have you here. Please uh, share with us your insights about veterans' homelessness. Well, thank you, Supervisor Foley, for the opportunity to speak today uh, and represent the veteran community, uh, both service providers and um, just those of us who have served. So I wanted to begin with, uh, first, just how we, how we got here. Uh, and that was uh, in April of 2021, I became the chair of the Orange County Veterans uh, Military Families Collaborative Housing Working Group. But that's not when this work began. This work began long before I took, uh, took uh, the position of the chair there. The framework was, was laid. Uh, a lot of it was done uh, after the 2019 point in time count. And after that, the Office of Care Coordination, in um, collaboration with several community partners, developed the Marching Home Strategy. It was a strategy to end veteran homelessness by December of 2020. Um, and so, so a few things happened. Uh, COVID happened, uh, and uh, I was gone. Uh, I ended up doing a deployment to Afghanistan. And so when I returned, I was uh, hoping to uh, come back to see us uh, have ended veteran homelessness. And I returned in August of 2020 and was kind of asking the question, what, what happened and what's, what's gone on and, and how did COVID impact that? And so that was a lot of the discussions. And uh, so as I became the chair, the first few months were really examining the marching home uh, strategy and to see what worked, what, had, what was accomplished and what still needed to be done, uh, what, what work was there for us to do. And so over the past year here, as, as you can see, uh, there's been a lot of research and meetings held to discuss the, the gap and understand what the data was saying and, and telling us about veteran homelessness and then what resources do we have available and what were the gaps in the community and how could we identify uh, resources to fill those gaps. And so the information I share with you as we move forward is a uh, combination of all of that cum uh, cumulative thought and input that we've gathered over the past year. Uh, every month, the housing group, uh, we meet and we discuss various uh, points of veteran uh, regarding veteran housing. And so what we present here, it's not my own opinion, but it's collective thought from the community. Uh, and so from the community, we all believe that housing is, is the solution. And the way we get there is we explore the data review progress and we've identified some opportunities here. The first thing we want to look at is the data. So in 2019, we had the point in time count. And in that point in time count, there were 311 homeless veterans. Of those, 144 were chronically homeless. Uh, move forward to January of 2021. Uh, and we have, now we have established the Veteran Registry through Coordinated Entry System. And on that registry, we have 205 homeless veterans, 23 of them have chronic. 
the latest numbers that we have, this was of uh, 415 of this year, of just a couple weeks ago, uh, from the Veteran Registry shows that we now have 223 homeless veterans and 85 of those are chronic. Uh, and so it, those numbers are hard to understand because uh, we're getting ready to show how many veterans we've housed. And so it really is, we, we need to do a deep dive into understanding these numbers uh, to see w why we continue to house veterans at a record pace. And at the same time, we see an increase in our homeless veterans and specifically our chronic homelessness. If we look up here, there's an increase of 62 chronic homeless veterans over the past 15 months. And so that's a that's an area that is we really want to analyze the data to try to understand what is happening in our system and why that's happening. But it's not to say we haven't done great work uh, because we have from uh, March 1st of 2020 until February 28th of 2021, uh, CES recorded that we housed 321 veterans. And then the following year, from February of 2021 until March 2022, we housed 201 veterans. Uh, and so that's housing a total of 522 veterans uh, over the past two years. And so that's where we said we really need to get into the data to understand if we're housing 522 and we started with 311, what is happening in the system and how can we improve uh, the number, how we can continue the success that we've had housing uh, veterans uh, while reducing the numbers uh, on our veteran registry. Uh, and uh, another point we want to bring up here is uh, Welcome Home OC, which has been uh, instrumental in helping us house uh, some of the most vulnerable veterans through uh, who have a VASH voucher, and they've been able to help house 127 veterans over the past year as well. So it really is a community effort uh, to make this happen. And so some of the progress that we've made here in Orange County regarding veteran housing is there have been, uh, from 2019, and prior to 2019, there were only eight VASH project-based units in Orange County. There are now 187 VASH project-based units built and being occupied by veterans. And that's through six communities throughout Orange County. Uh, and 2021 alone, uh, we, the VA housed 143 veterans at these project-based sites. In addition to that, they housed 251 using a VASH voucher. And so those are tenant-based vouchers where they are allowed to, to be housed anywhere throughout the community. Uh, so we've really made a lot of progress working with the VA and the housing authorities to, to really tackle the permanent supportive housing issue. And What's not mentioned here is that there are 68 units that are currently in process in some form of development for veterans uh, throughout Orange County. So we will be able to add 68 units here uh, by 2023 uh, on top of the 187 that we have. So the progress that we continue to make, we have Welcome Home OC who is able to work with those tenant-based vouchers who uh, through landlord initiatives and landlord recruitment are able to help house those um, some of our more uh, difficult veterans that, that are out there struggling to find housing. Uh, we also have weekly CES match meetings, uh, the court, which is coordinated entry system. Coordinated entry system also maintains the by name list or the veteran registry, which is a requirement of uh, meeting the federal criteria and benchmarks to ending veteran homelessness. Our veteran service providers throughout the uh, county are great at collaborating, uh, and you can jump on a phone, you, they'll send emails, uh, you do Zoom or Teams meetings, everybody works together for one goal, and that's to end the units. And then our development of the project-based units, like I said we went from eight to 187. So, so that progress over the past two years is, is really phenomenal. And so our opportunities for growth, uh, the first one is a veteran-specific interim housing. Uh, and we may ask why. So one of the reasons why is to meet the federal benchmarks and criteria. One, we need to end chronic veteran homelessness. We need a system that connects veterans to permanent housing within 90 days. Uh, we need to have sufficient permanent housing capacity. Uh, and following the housing first model, we need to have interim housing or a place to, pre, uh, where ser to provide service intensive um, support to veterans in need uh, that may not be ready for permanent housing at the moment. 
Uh, and that is really what we're trying to strive here. And to do this, Project Home Key is a great example of how we can use funds now to address this immediate need. We currently have 85 chronic homeless veterans in Orange County. By being able to take a uh, pro use Project Home Key and find an area that we can develop and create this interim housing for veterans, we can really start to impact the one, the number of unsheltered veterans, which in February of this year, it was reported that there were 151 unsheltered veterans in Orange County. So we can really address that by having a veteran specific interim housing uh, that is focused on and knowledgeable around veteran specific issues. We find a service provider uh, that is willing to come in that has a history of working with veterans. Uh, and. I, I oversee for Jamboree, non-veteran specific, but I oversee the two home key sites in Stanton. And I've been able to see the success of, of how being able to work with those who are chronically homeless, uh, which right now 68% of our population are chronically homeless at home key. And so being able to work with them and help them as they go through some of the barriers that they may have, whether it be um, reluctance to go into permanent housing, uh, being connected to the appropriate uh, mental health resources or health resources or really just walk, helping them walk through the process and once we've been able to identify them we get them in immediately and I, I heard it mentioned on a previous panel that you don't want to wait days or hours before you get somebody into an open shelter we need to get them in that moment and so being able to uh, provide this uh, interim housing would really help us to make a dent in reducing those numbers um, and then the, another thing that we would be able to do is if we have a veteran preference for affordable housing, I, I know that we have uh, a, an example through Park Darien, it's in Irvine, and they actually have 16 units that they have a, a veteran preference for. Uh, and so they have a wait list already where they have a veteran wait list and they have uh, a, a non-veteran wait list. So that's an example. Again, when we go back to the federal benchmarks and criteria and that we need to have sufficient permanent housing capacity, permanent support, we need permanent supportive housing, but also being able to get those veterans who are kind of missing the cusp, right, uh, who are over income for permanent supportive housing or they're higher functioning, but they're still not able to afford market rates. So being able to bring them in and fold them into affordable housing with a preference would also help us to be able to decrease the number of veterans that we have experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then the last thing we really want to promote is seeing that having a developing centralized veteran leadership in Orange County. Uh, uh, committee uh, that is veteran led with real life experiences who understands the challenges that it takes uh, to work with veterans. Oftentimes veterans don't want to open up to individuals who are not uh, peers who have not served with them. Uh, they're very knowledgeable of veteran specific issues uh, and the complexity around veteran services. Uh, and we want to continue to this uh, leadership would continue to build upon the work that's already been done. Uh, we would define collective impact. And what does that mean for Orange County in ending veteran homelessness? How, as a collective, taking all entities, taking the continuum of care, taking private uh, public ventures and other assets that are out there, how can we bring it all together? What does collective impact look like? Uh, and how does that uh, create shared goals and objectives to create a, a functional strategy to end veteran homelessness in Orange County that has real uh, objectives, obtainable objectives and timelines set to it, uh, and not just saying this is a, a goal that we want to achieve, but, but putting some action and some accountability behind it. Uh, and, and I say that because I, you know, I'm an NCO. I, I've been a non-commissioned officer for the majority of my, my career uh, in both the uh, Marine Corps and the Army, and, and NCOs are the backbone. And that's what we're asking for here, is we need to have a backbone of, of veteran leadership really pushing this forward to hold accountability uh, to make sure that this is done. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce uh, Josh Chobin. He's a, a Navy vet 
who is currently homeless but has a vast voucher and would be the ideal candidate of someone that we would want to put into an interim housing that we believe we'd be able to house within 90 days uh, or less, uh, and it would prevent him from having to stay on the streets while he looks for that permanent housing. So, Josh. Mr. Choman, did you want to say a few words? Um, I just want to say that the housing market right now is very bad. Um, finding apartments is very difficult. Uh, get a lot of no's. I know our office has been working with you, and I'll just throw it out there. If anyone has a two-bedroom apartment is willing to take an emergency voucher, we have a veteran here that needs your help. Um, he has uh, children, and he wants to live near his children so that he can visit them. So we're very, um, we're, we're here to try to help, and I know my team has been helping you. So thank you, Mr. Owens. Thank you for your work on behalf of veterans. I wrote down some of your action items that you recommended, and we'll talk more about that um, later. We're, we're getting back to being on time, so we're, we're only two minutes behind for this particular speaking panel. So <laughs> um, I'm gonna move on to Dr. Shantina Sorrells. And Dr. Sorrells, can you give us an overview of the crisis of youth homelessness in our community and share your recommendations in you know 10 minutes? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll do my best to keep it short or maybe even get us under. Um, so one, thanks, Supervisor Foley, first, for having us here and having this panel. Um, second, I think one of the things that is the most common question is, is youth homelessness a problem? And I'm here to say it is. Um, definitely it is. And so starting out by just talking about why it's a problem, the stats, and why it's an invisible problem that we often think doesn't exist. And so for us at Orangewood, we serve upwards of 1,500 youth a year, ages 16 to 24. But of those youth, we see nearly 30% of our youth are actually homeless today. Nearly 40% of our youth are one bad, challenging life experience away from being homeless. And so we know that it is a serious problem in the youth that we serve that we see every single day. The reason why that often is not something that is, is seen in the big screen or in the big picture is because one, the way youth experience homelessness is very different than other populations. A lot more times they're often um, cohabitating, living with others in a temporary status, they're couch surfing, they're finding ways to kind of make ends meet to be able to get a few weeks here and a few weeks there. They're wearing out their welcome places, they're doing whatever they can but that is still homelessness. They don't have a permanent place where they can call home or be housed. And so that is one of the issues. The other issue is we have 150 youth who leave foster care every single year in our county. So knowing that all of the resources and services we have, not only foster youth are homeless, but that's a large number and the influx coming in every single year. And while we have extended foster care, which has been a wonderful intervention, there really hasn't been um, a change in what happens at 18 than what happens at 21 now. So we've just moved it down the line. And so that's another way to see the problem and think about the problem. When you think about unhoused youth, you really have to think about the extreme vulnerability, especially because of where they are in their developmental cycle. Where they are is different than an adult who's 30 years old, 35 years old, or 40 years old. And so if we're talking about the most vulnerable time of their lives, this 16 to 24 year old range, this is a time where they're more likely to be exploited, extorted, they're, they're roped into decision making and things that are not going to help them down the road. And everything I've heard on this panel and all day about chronic homelessness, I keep just thinking, what if we went upstream? What if the prevention was there? What if we were able to do the work on the front end just as much as we're doing on the back end because they are both absolutely in need, but then we could circumvent these problems down the road, especially when we're talking about mental health. We know that the onset happens in adolescence and transitional age. And if we can get the right services there, we don't have chronic down the road. If we can get the addiction and substance use services up front, it doesn't change the physiological structure of their brain from years of abuse and then we end up down the road. So we really do have to look at those concerns up front on the prevention side. And then we have to think about what are the unique needs of Tay. We have to have services specific to this age range, where they're at and all of the things that I just mentioned, how their decision making functions. We have to have staff, agencies, services that are directed towards that age range. We know that lumping them in with the entire adult population is not working. It's not serving their needs and what they need. 
We've had some successes and I wanna highlight those and talk about those because they are there. One of the first things is this year we had our first COC funded youth point in time count, which is fantastic. Um, first, I wanna say we need to continue to do those. This was our first year, so there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of methodology. There's a lot of things to figure out. I will be honest, the numbers aren't representative, and I think it's going back to the what I mentioned earlier, so we need to continue to do it so we can really flush that out and have better data to actually determine how we can address this problem. And then we had our first youth shelter open. So Covenant House opened their first 25-bed youth shelter specifically for transitional age youth, the first one in Orange County. It is already full and has an immense wait list upwards of nine months. So we have to have more emergency shelter. We have to have it where it's TAY focused. Secondarily, I mean, we have had some great success. Orangewood Foundation applied for a youth emergency services grant from the state of California. So we are in partnership with Covenant House as well as Welcome Home OC and providing those case management services and we have a drop-in center. Those are all phenomenal resources, but we have to have a place for our youth to go. So which brings me to some action items that I would love to, to discuss with you. So one, continue funding that youth point in time count is definitely needed. <coughs> we have had many vouchers influx into the community. Um, in 2019, we had five vouchers dedicated to former foster youth. We now have 120. But with that number of 150 leaving care every year, those vouchers are taken, they are filled. We have had very little turnover in those vouchers. In fact, I think five total so far. So we need more vouchers for sure across our county. We need to expand our emergency shelter that is dedicated to Tay. We need permanent supportive housing options. I think this is a um, avenue that's often overlooked because of Tay and the societal understanding that they're young and they'll just bounce back and figure it out. But many of our youth are struggling with a lifetime of trauma um, onset of mental health, addiction and substance use, and so preventing by intervening early is really what we need to think about in this realm and that permanent supportive housing would offer that. Currently there is no permanent supportive housing for K at all in Orange County. And so that is a desperate need. And then project-based voucher. Um, developments that are coming along, up, upcoming in our county, we really need to think about carving out units specifically for Tay. When you put a Tay who has no credit history, no apartment rental history up against anyone else who has a history, they're not gonna be the first candidate to receive those units. And so we need to make sure there are units dedicated to them with supportive services entwined by agencies who understand Understand and serve those in that age range. So I think that's another point that we can definitely make. One successful thing in the state, um, the state has now allowed senior housing to be mixed with Tay housing, and that's a unique thing that we could possibly look at, especially with our growing population of seniors and the need there for permanent supportive housing. And so you have younger individuals learning from these life learners and folks who have so much to offer and the vitality of the young people keeping them going and having many activities. And so that's just one solution that has happened in other counties that it's been super successful. And we need to continue with our landlord incentive programs. Speaking of all of the things I just spoke from, but we need to make sure there's funding available for that. And then we can continue those programs so that people are willing to rent to our Tay youth who they may see as more of a risk than some of our other populations. All right. Yeah. Thank you You're welcome. for that. I, uh, those are a lot of great recommendations. I have a question. Um, can you share briefly about the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project? I recently learned that San Diego County has received a, a grant and they got approximately $4 million to reduce youth homelessness. And so what are the requirements and uh, do we have such a program here in Orange County? It's a fantastic question, Supervisor. So we are looking into that as part of the TAY committee of the COC board. We are looking into that. We have reviewed the application. We are going to apply with the knowledge of knowing that we actually don't have all of the components right now. And as what are those components? We have to have a youth action board. So we actually have to have a board of youth who are decision makers. And so one of the things that has been taking some time is the compensation structure for those youth who should be compensated for their lived expertise and having them be able to maintain all of their other services along with serving on that board. So one of your recommendations is that we create a youth action board that receives some kind of stipend from the county? Absolutely. Okay. 
And then what other eligibility requirements? We have to have our plans already set and ordered and the NOFA is due in June. And so we are working on some of those, but those have to be directed by the board. So we have to get the board before we can even create those plans. Okay. But our goal is to apply, receive the feedback. Um, we know that the other counties who have applied, they applied up to two times before, did not get it. But the feedback and the support they got for the application. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. Let's buy <laughs> once and get it all done correctly okay. so we don't have to wait. We will shoot for that. Okay, let's work on that. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I'm going to move us along. Um, I like your idea of a Project Home Key Youth Project. So I think that um, we'll talk about that later. Okay. So we're going to wrap up. We're... we're, we're way past time but <laughs> so so uh bex unfortunately with uh, being the last speaker you've got the least amount of time um so we are going to wrap up with bex hayho from the uh united way uh united to end homelessness so bex thank you so much supervisor i will do my best to run through some recommendations over the various items that i heard being discussed this morning so the first was a repeated theme from every panel we've had that housing is the ultimate solution for ending homelessness. So when we think about housing, we think about two things, building more permanent supportive housing and affordable housing in our community. So a couple of things that we can do there, we heard earlier from Supervisor Chafee about the Orange County Housing Finance Trust. There are actually 11 cities in our, in our county that have not joined the Housing Finance Trust yet. So it would be wonderful to see those 11 cities officially join the trust, which would put us as a collective community in a much more advantageous place to advocate and lobby for more funding to come to the Orange County Housing Finance Trust so that we can build more permanent supportive housing and affordable housing. I'm going to interrupt you. Can you tell us what are the benefits to a city to join the housing trust? Why do they need to join? Yeah, so uh, the benefits, there are benefits for the city if they chose to move forward in building permanent supportive housing. They don't have to do that if they join the Housing Finance Trust, but it means that as a collective community, we can help each other. So perhaps a group of cities want to work together to build permanent supportive housing. If those cities are all members of the trust, they're able to pull down funding to make that development happen. Thank you. Of course. We've already heard about home key, so I won't spend any time there, but yes to more home key developments happening in our community. Um, when it comes to building permanent supportive housing, another area that could be, that I heard being discussed earlier is just that support for cities that are contemplating it. What does it mean? Learning for, from the mayor of Stanton, for example, around how did they help citizens come to terms with that, understand the benefits of permanent supportive housing, so that we can have more local advocates coming out to support those developments. When we also think about housing and we think about scattered site housing, apartments that already exist in our community, and how do people who've received a rental assistance voucher from one of the housing authorities access that? And we heard earlier from the veteran that there is a severe lack of housing that is affordable to voucher holders. We actually sent out our team at United Way. We sent our team out over six days to 30 cities in the community. We had identified 605 apartment communities that should have had units that would be affordable to voucher holders. We were able to make contact with 196 of those apartment communities. That represented 29,244 units amongst their various apartment communities. There were 138 vacancies. Of those vacancies, 26 were affordable to a voucher holder. So there's a severe lack of apartment inventory in our community that is affordable to people who have vouchers. So how do we address that? A couple of things, advocating on the federal level for more funding for our housing authorities, increasing the number of vouchers that can come to our community, and increasing the funding available for public housing authorities to be able to implement those vouchers in our community. We also need to make it more attractive for landlords and owners to want to work with voucher holders. 
We have run a lot of different experiments. Um, we have over 100 property owners that work with us at United Way in our Welcome Home OC Landlord Incentive Program. And we recently experimented with offering significant bonuses um, to property owners to provide more units. And we found that property owners were very interested in that because they could use that to offset the rent that they couldn't get from a voucher holder that they could get from the market. So the creative use of flexible funding to make it more uh, um, attractive to landlords to want to work with voucher holders is another area that we can look at. Combined with this, I also heard the need for coordination. That was a common theme throughout the panels. When we think about voucher holders accessing scattered site apartments in the community, we need coordination between support services for those voucher holders, landlord incentives, um, all coming together. So how do we fund things in their entirety? How do we make sure that when housing authorities have vouchers, that it is able to be braided with funding for case management and funding for landlord incentives? So as a community, how do we create ongoing secure funding strategies to enable that to happen so we're not constantly scrambling year after year to try to put the pieces together to make it work for the next 12 months? I also heard around the need for metrics and outcomes and performance measures and just wanted to offer up that at the continuum of care, um, so I'll put that other hat on for a moment, that we have to report to HUD on our performance metrics and outcomes. And so in terms of looking at um, an option for what that could look like for county funded contracts, that might be a good starting place to be able to look at the HUD required uh, metrics that have to be reported out regularly um, and that might help us have some apples to apples comparisons as we move forward. And then the last but certainly not the least important of the things that I want to talk about is the importance of the voice of lived expertise. We heard about it from Dr. Sorrells, but I also want to take note that we do have in the audience today Tim Houchen. Tim Houchen is a fellow member of the Continuum of Care Board. He is the chair of the lived experience committee of the Continuum of Care Board. When I was listening to the information from Moss Adams and the information from Moonwalk, it struck me that we need that voice of people who have experienced the broken systems to speak into how to bring about the changes that are needed. And so having them at the table from, to be able to speak from their vantage point is extremely important. Um, and we heard about the need and actually the HUD requirement of that in order for us to receive their funding to address youth homelessness. So HUD recognizes the importance of that. The continuum of care has recognized the importance of that. And I think it would be great as a community that we consider how to use the people who have experienced homelessness, their real life experiences, their expertise to help shape policies, to help shape procedures, um, and to help really identify and overcome those gaps that we heard about in terms of accessing services. And so with that, I will come to an end and hopefully I did my best to keep us on time. Really great. <laughs> great. And, and I want to thank you all. I want to thank all the panelists throughout the day. Uh, great summary, uh, Ms. Hayhoe. And I also want to thank our team that helped put this together and our county team that works tirelessly on these issues. Um, as I said at the beginning, the goal of this hearing is a fact finding. I think we heard a lot um, of new information and coupled with some existing information that many of us who work in this space already know, but I'm hopeful that the, the new information will help us to go down a, another path to be able to analyze some other issues that might help us to form a more cohesive plan to end homelessness. There's certainly more work to be done, but I wanted to uh, supplement some of the comments that Ms. Hayhoe summarized as to what we heard here today. What I heard here today was recommendations regarding um, a consistent uh, both case management and enforcement 
program so that it's a consistent across the county that it's not just over here in the North Spa we do this one thing and over here in Costa Mesa we do another thing and in Stanton something completely different so if we could have some more consistency from our county uh, programming I've, I've heard that that is uh, needed. I also heard that we need to do a better job working with our railroad partners. And so Mayor, Stan, Mayor uh, Shaver, I'm going to uh, take you up on that offer to make the introduction there. And then I also heard that um, while funding is available, it's not and this is something that I've already knew, but <laughs> um, was corroborated, funding is available, it's not flowing to the cities, and the cities are using their general fund dollars um, in an enormous amount to be able to address what, in my opinion, is a county-related um, requirement. And so we also ha heard from Moss Adams that um, we, we are funding services. We're doing a good job of funding services and reacting to need, but we're not funding outcomes. And so this goes back to what um, Ms. Hayhoe just mentioned. We need to develop some kind of a plan that's based on metrics. Maybe HUD is a great starting place, um, but where we have outcomes that we are seeking to achieve and that the funding is tied to those outcomes, not just services. Um, I also heard that um, the Orange County Housing Finance Trust is a resource that maybe we're not completely taking advantage of, and maybe we can do more. We can recruit those 11 other cities into the Finance Trust. Chairman Chapey did a great job of explaining it. Um, we, can, we can invest in the Finance Trust to address uh, youth housing and the Tay permanent supportive housing, so that that does it, that releases that clog in the system. Invest in veterans specific housing, so that we're releasing the clog in the system where people are going from shelter to maybe some transitional housing, but they don't have a permanent home from which to live. Um, and I also heard veteran specific interim housing is really important. Project Home Key is a perfect medium for that and so I'm hopeful that we can do more of those projects and veteran preference uh, in affordable housing, um, youth homeless housing preference. Um, so those are issues that I will try to bring forward. The landlord incentives, flex flexible funds to utilize our vouchers. We talked about that at our, our town hall. Um, the voucher system is intended to help people like John here, and it's not working because, as Ms. Hayhoe pointed out, what did you say? We have only 26 affordable housing units in all the 29,000 uh, rental units that are available in Orange County of the 196 apartment communities that you surveyed. So, I mean, that's a pretty big sample, um, and if we take that large sample and we see that we're only receiving a handful of, of vacancies, you know, we've got to do something different. And so we've got to really hone in on how do we get these emergency vouchers out. I can tell you we won't get any more funding from the federal government if we can't use the existing vouchers and place people. I had a conversation with our Congresswoman Katie Porter about this very issue um, because you know they do monitor this stuff and they see that our vouchers, we still have a lot of vouchers we haven't used. And so we have to figure out a way to get our get more um, capacity in the system. And then um, I heard that we need to create a youth action board so that we can apply for millions of dollars in grants to help youth homelessness. And so there were many takeaways and I heard from our Moss Adams team that we also need to um, maybe have a, a better system in our contracts, better language in our contracts so we can better monitor. Uh, so we will review the hearing and write, um, write up the list of recommendations that we heard from each of the panelists today. And at the end, we need a strategic plan that's not a 10-year plan. I think we all saw that doesn't really work. We need a shorter-term plan um, that's county-led. We need a regional approach to 
housing, and homelessness, and um, we need to fund outcomes, not services. So I hope you all learned something here today. I do want to open it up for public comment. And if we have any members of the public who would like to speak at uh, this time and share your insights, um, you can come to the podium here if there's anyone who would like to speak. Yes, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Tim Houchin. Uh, I'm a member of the Continuum of Care Board and the chairman of the Lived Experience Advisory Committee for the CLC. I'm formerly homeless, actually living here at the Civic Center uh, between the years of 2010 and 2015. I sometimes slept right outside the walls of this building. Uh, anyways, um, I, I've come a long way since then. In 2015, I was placed in the permanent support of housing uh, by the grace of God and my community that gave me a second chance. Uh, and I think that, um, that I've tried to prove that I was worthy of that second chance and, uh, and since then. I'd like to say that um, thanks to Bex for getting me in there because I was, didn't think I'd have the opportunity to speak. But um, uh, yes, I, I do notice that, um, that our panels of experts uh, today uh, were, were great, uh, but they were depleted of any uh, lived experience. And that's something that I'd like to see change in the future. Uh, I, I, um, I value my experience. I, I'm not ashamed of my experience anymore. I actually find value in it because I can share it with others and help them. <clears throat> I'd also like to say that um, something I see uh, that, uh, that we missed out at the county for a while has been uh, the participation of our community. And homelessness is, uh, is, a, uh, is something that, a social issue that just cannot be taken on the shoulders of any uh, public entity, uh, city, county, or otherwise. It's something that has to involve the community. Everybody has to be involved. We're all stakeholders. We're all affected by homelessness. So we all have to take on a responsibility uh, to ourselves and to our neighbors to take care of that problem. And, uh, and I think that uh, we need to somehow engage the community a little bit more uh, and uh, bring those stakeholders into the game. Give, give them some skin in the game to, uh, uh, to uh, end homelessness here. Anyway, uh, there's other things i got to say, but I don't want to keep it short. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. You know, I just want to take a moment to congratulate you. Um, it is wonderful that you were able to get yourself um, to a place where you're here today speaking and helping um, to end homelessness. And I want to ask you, because I know we hear so many times that there's so many outreaches that are required before a person will make the choice. And if you're willing, I would love to hear what was it that caused you to make the decision to end your own homelessness? Well, you know, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, if you were given the, if you were homeless and you were given the opportunity to be housed, okay, I don't know of anybody that would really pass up on that, okay? I think that sometimes um, we get conflicted by um, what the definition of service resistant is or housing resistant. Uh, and so I don't think that anybody in their right mind at all would turn down a place to live with a roof over their head. Um, so we have to ask, when we ask somebody, if we go out to the street to see someone today and we say, hey, would you want to you know, be in housing? Would you like a place to live? But we don't have the place to give them to live. And that's the, that's the real uh, problem right there. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else wish to provide any public comment at this time? No? Okay. We will end the hearing, and uh, this will be posted on our website and our um, social media. We will also will post, uh, we'll prepare a, a summary of recommendations, and we'll post that on the website. And I just want to thank everyone for participating. And I'm available uh, as well as I'm sure any of the panelists to answer any questions from any of the media. Thank you so much.